Mark, come on up, please. Uh, Mark's got a proposal, I believe. Talk to us about uh, economic development. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you guys for investing the time with me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to address some issues today that I think are obviously of great concern to you, to me, and I think to everyone in the community. Uh, I've got some proposals here that I'll pass around. And I'm going to go. I want to go through this uh, presentation relatively quickly. There's a lot of statistics in it, and it's kind of mind numbing. Statistics. <laughs> I can't me, believe it. Me uh, statistics. Wow. What? what a chance. <laughs> But, you know, I look at these statistics, and every statistic tells a story, and those stories are about the people that live in our community. You know, there's families, there's young people. Uh, they're being adversely impacted by our continuing struggle with the economy. So, you know, there's a reason why Jackson County is, you know, out of the 36 counties in the state, is the strongest of all 36. And I believe the same principles that made this county the strongest fiscally could be applied to make this, this community the strongest community economically. And uh, I'm going to turn this light down a little bit, I apologize. And that's not exactly what's going on right now. Can you guys just see okay? Yeah. Okay. So I would like to start off by asking some questions. And they seem rhetorical, but they're really not. Um, I actually asked uh, uh, County Minister Danny Jordan some of these questions um, a few days ago. And I think I already know the answer, but let you ponder these questions while we're going through this. Does anybody from our federal, our state, or local uh, agency partners ever ask these questions or, or propose solutions? Um, one is a comprehensive and detailed outline and analysis of our significant long-term regional economic challenges. And if the question, if, if the answer is no, I would ask why not. And if the answer is yes, I would say, well, then what have we done about it? And you could ask that same question for each one of these issues. A realistic and substantive strategic plan to transform our regional economy. It needs transformation. We're in the bottom 4% for the lowest wages in the country right now. Number three, a strategic plan to create new streams of tax revenue to help Jackson County offset what's been lost from declining federal ONC tax payments. Number four, a strategic plan to make Jackson County fairgrounds self-sustaining. And number five, a strategic plan that will help reduce other Jackson County expenditures and our dependence upon the federal government for our ever-increasing service program needs, such as the Health and Human Services Department and the building being built across the street. Again, these statistics, you guys, are really uncomfortable for me to consider as much as they are for anybody else, but it's our reality. And so uh, I appreciate the great work that you're doing. I think there's an opportunity to leverage the great work and the influence and the position you've got here to make things even better. So if we look at the things that, that define the strength of Jackson County's economy, historically it's been timber, but right now, uh, you know, the vocal minorities run in this country and we're hamstrung from access and our own resources to our own detriment. That's just kind of the way things are. We're the Saudi Arabia of timber production, <laughs> but we can't hardly access any of it. It's crazy. You know, we've got retirement. That's a significant economic impact on this region. We've got a university. We've got uh, health care. We've got tourism. We've got some agriculture. We've got some manufacturing. But all those things put together, we're still in the bottom four percent lowest wages in the country so we need to do more I think some people see me this way perhaps as an agitator <laughs> I hope that's not me and I hope that's not how I come across uh, a little agitation in life could be a good thing I see myself as being more of a device for sure and shaking things up maybe like the proverbial grain of sand inside the oyster that causes just enough irritation for that oyster to react and make something beautiful out of it and I hope that that's what's going to happen here with this idea and if I sound a little uh, preachy here, you guys, I apologize, but I realize I'm preaching to the choir with you. You know, there's a reason why you're on that end of the table and I'm on this end of the table. I, I look at you guys and say you're servant leaders. you got a heart to serve this community. All of you, I think, ran on platforms uh, of creating jobs and helping the economy. And so, again, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm not, I want to make sure you understand. I don't feel like I'm lecturing you guys. I feel like these stats that are told in this presentation are, are kind of lecturing and educating me about what's wrong and what we need to do to get a different outcome. I found that organization about uh, four years ago. I'm not here to talk about it, but I knew that something was going on intuitively with our tech sector and just hadn't really connected the dots. 
Um, how does the chief of business, I'm sure you saw this article, and it, it contrasted our, uh, what, I, what I perceive to be an abysmal investment in economic development regionally in comparison to, say, uh, our sister organization over, over in Ben. I say our, it sounds like I'm speaking on behalf of Surrey. I'll make that abundantly clear. I'm not. you got Ron Fox here and a couple of our board members to speak for Surrey, so I'm absolutely not here to speak on behalf of Surrey. But, but the, the point of this article is what we're doing is, is not working. So I call this the roadmap to regional economic resiliency. I think that we need a roadmap because we're not, our region is not economic re, economically resilient. And we got to, you know, in order to figure out where we're going, we need to have understand, to get a better understanding of where we are. And that's where I start off. You know, our, we have these, and I, you guys, again, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. We have these video poker proceeds that are earmarked by state statute for economic development. And under, the, under that very long list, it does, the very first thing it does say is job creation. And so there's other, uh, there's other places that that money could go, and I'm not here to necessarily second guess or lecture you on where that money should go. I'm just saying that based on the return on investment we've got in terms of jobs, uh, we're not getting it done. If you look at this chart, it shows 13 of the 36 counties in the state, and the average that they allocate to their economic development enterprises is about 35%, and we're at about 3.6%. The cities tell a similar story. This is what was the art in the article uh, back in February. The cities in white are those that support uh, uh, EDCO, sister organization of so ready over in Bend. They contribute on average $2.38 per capita in economic development annually. And, and the cities and the darker cities are those that belong and support so ready that contribute on average 38 cents. $2.38 versus 38 cents. Ben's market economy is outgrowing ours for job growth by, by better than 3 to 1 right now. There's a reason for that. So we'll talk about some current challenges. Our MSA is, you know, San Francisco Metropolitan Statistical Area. The good news is we're on a list of the top 179 best performing small cities, and it includes Medford and all of Jackson County. The not so good news is we've been free falling. The last five years we've fallen 75 places. And it's not just so much that we're falling, other cities are outperforming ours. And I'm, I'm one, we want to be objective and say why? You know, why, why not consider what are they doing that we're not doing, or what are we doing that we shouldn't be doing? Medford's currently ranked 114 out of 179. That's what the analysis is based upon. We're 160 out of 179 for job growth. We're 166 for wage growth. And truth be known, I think it's actually even worse than this. Ten years ago, we were number 12 on that list. We have gone down in the last 10 years 102 places. And again, not just so much that we're falling as those cities are outperforming ours. And I think it's okay to ask why. This shows you year-to-year -year job growth for the six metro markets in the state of Oregon, of which Medford is one. We're, we're consistently, every single month I watch this, we're bringing up the rear. Unemployment rates, Oregon's 18% above the U.S. average, Jackson County's 41%, Josephine County's 60% above the U.S. average. Median wages, and I realize this is 2012 data, the, the, the data got updated a few months ago, but, but our place in the statistical rankings in the United States is still the same. We're, we're just uh, under $1,000 higher than that uh, this year for 2013. But at 29% below the U.S. average, our median wage of 37 and some change puts us in the bottom 4% for the lowest wages in the country. And the state of Oregon uses the same metrics that I do. They look at the 334 largest counties in the United States, of which Jackson County is one. Guys, we were holding steady up until this summer at number 311, in the bottom 7%. This summer, it was reported by the Oregon Employment Department, we dropped to number 320. We're now in the bottom 4%. The point is, without a strong foundation of family wage jobs, people don't have a lot of expendable cash in their pocket to support the local economy. Go to your rotary, you'll find out the majority of the businesses there belong to, to this local economy that depend upon what happens here. The same is true of our chamber. We've got chamber board members here. We, if you look at the chamber directory, 99% of those members are not traded sector businesses. They're all businesses that are based here and dependent upon what happens here. Look at the yellow pages. You know, all of the people that advertise the yellow pages are local business, depending upon what happens here. There's not enough happening here to make our economy as vibrant and resilient and sustainable as it, it would, could, and should be if we, if we do something different. Joseph County raises 34% below the U.S. average. That was 2012 numbers? Yeah, those are 2012 numbers, but that 4% statistic is still true. So the, the 2013 data that came out a few months ago, and I just realized when I was looking at this last night, I hadn't updated it, but we're still in the bottom 4%.
even though that 36 is uh, from 2012, uh, we are still in the bottom 4 percent. Historically, we trail Washington. Washington wages are about 8 percent above Oregon's right now, and Oregon's are about, or I'm sorry, 8 percent above the U.S. average, and Oregon wages are about 20, 12 percent below. There's about a 20 percent swing. There's a generational impact of this, this uh, ad, adverse impact of this brain drain. There's a gentleman by the name of Mark McMullen, he's a state economist. I read an article that he wrote, and I called him to validate. I was interpreting what he was saying correctly, and he said, you are. And basically, the gist of it, you guys, is that when, when in rural Oregonian communities, which I know that Medford is not, but Josephine County is, and we've got a lot of rural areas surrounding Medford that make up our community. So he said, in rural Oregonian communities, when your death rate exceeds your birth rate, he said a lot of these communities will reach the point of no return. And I said, do you think that's happening down here? And he said, yes, you just don't know about it yet. I said, really? That's unfortunate. We need to know about it. Here's the statistics that validate that. Over a 30-year period from 1980 to 2010, in Jackson County, uh, 30 years ago, we had two births for every death. We're at the break-even point right now. Josephine County had one and a half births for every death. They're about half that, 0.7. The point is we're not replacing our younger generation, which is the future workforce, and the leaders in our community because a lot of these kids are leaving going somewhere else because we haven't created sufficient opportunity for the ones that want to stay or come back. This shows you over a three year period from 2000 to 2013, here's the death, the birth rate and the death rate in Jackson County. We're about 355 births above. Josephine County has crossed way to the dark side, about 1,200 births down. And if you look at this net inward migration, Jackson County's population increased by 2,749 people over that three-year period. So if you look at the net increase, it's only only about 10% of that is from our homegrown, <laughs> our homegrown next generation. So what that tells me, you know, we've got this continual uptick in our population, and it gives us somewhat of a false sense of security because we feel like we're growing. But that that net migration is primarily what I call equity refugees who are primarily retirees, and the, the, the uh, economic multiplier associated with transfer payments is not the same as young families who are getting started in life. So, so the older generation is coming to one side of the valley while the younger folks are leaving out the other side. And it's going to have multi-generational impacts because these young people will take their great educations that a lot of parents, including some of this room, pay for, and they're going to go somewhere else to build the economy somewhere else and have their kids somewhere else who will continue that cycle. And I'm going to paint with a broad brush to make the point. We're left with a generation of kids that are acclimated to a mindset of scarcity and entitlement, and that is absolutely having multi-generational impacts right now as, as we speak. These, these statistics are about the same as they were during the height of the recession. Our childhood poverty rate in Jackson County is 25% above the U.S. average. Josephine County is 45% above the U.S. average. Food assistance. And in, in the nation, one in, one in six people is on food assistance in the United States. In Oregon, it's one in five. In our two-county region, it's one in four. 25% of our population is receiving some kind of food assistance. Additional sobering stats. Seven out of eight MSAs across the United States, of which there are about 200 similar size to ours, have lower unemployment rates than we have. Our community has the second highest elementary and high school student homeless rate in the state. And just because there's not a bunch of kids camped out under the, a bridge uh, somewhere, it's kind of an outside, out of mind phenomenon. But what that means is these kids, we've got about 1,100 kids in our school district that are in very unstable situations at home. And again, I look at these statistics, and they're just as mind-numbing to me as they are to you, I'm sure. But I look at them, and it's like each one of these statistics tells a story. These kids have a very unstable home situation. I'll get a little personal with you and tell you there's a reason why I feel so preachy and so passionate about this. You're looking at a kid that went to 22 grade schools and 8 high schools. Okay? Very unstable situation. I have a lot of compassion for kids that are in this situation. I'm telling you, the majority of them will be either in nosedive and they're going to wind up being a burden to society down the road if we don't do something to reverse this trend. That means those kids, by the way, are moving an average of about four times per year and living in a situation that's not their, their direct family. 56% of our kids qualify for food assistance at 65 in Grants Pass. This is really unfortunate. 2008 to 2012. This was this is the front. You remember this? was the front page above the fold Sunday Mail Tribune article uh, in July that said from 2008 to 2012 there's a 149% increase in the number of people younger than 18 getting mental health support from RVMC. One mental health interventionist. Now we have mental health interventionists stationed in our high schools. Said 80% of what I do is reparenting. 
and this is the multi-generational impact I'm talking about. I wish that we never had that word. I wish that word had never been spoken, that we didn't need that word. Reparenting, what does that mean? That means these kids are not being parented and and they're not being given the basic life skills to cope with stress and and, and what happens in life, and they're having to go to the mental health interventionists who are having directly to our hospital. It used to be that we would have maybe one kid a month needed some form of intervention uh, for having some suicidal tendencies. Now they're saying it's one, two a week in the Medford School District. Parents is a term that's medical job. If you're not familiar with it, it defines the, the private sector insurance contribution to overall regional health care costs. Our payer mix is 27% below Oregon's average. It's 37% below the U.S. average. Low wages usually include low benefits. Hence the need for the Jackson County Health and Services Building to wind up servicing tens of thousands of more people than it was originally anticipated to. You guys know the term uh, labor participation rate. That's your workforce available between ages 16 and retirement. With 50 being bad, Oregon is number 49 right now. And not to get political, but if you segregate those numbers over the last four years, we're actually dead last. Okay? Jackson County out of 36 counties, we're number 30. So if Oregon's about the, you know, the worst labor participation rate in the country, and we're bringing up the rear of the state of Oregon, to me, again, this is very sobering uh, to contemplate the issues that we've got to deal with. This isn't about recreating California. I'd like to neutralize that perception. You guys know what we're talking about today. More than 50% of our land is controlled by the feds. Josephine County is more than 70%. Uh, we, Oregon has the most restrictive zoning overlay of all 50 states. And, and we live in a bowl. Which, you know, the, the mountains trap the air, so there's significant restrictions on what we can and cannot do to grow our economy. You can't do things to cause atmospheric emissions. And I think everybody's okay with clean air. But the point is, we've only got so much land and there's only so much that we can do with it. So my proposition is, let's do something more effective and more beneficial for the community. And I like to joke, especially in Rotary. It's like, hey, if this is driving you to drink, hey, there is an alternative. We all know about it. You know, it's like measures are on the ballot. Am I suggesting maybe we smoke a little medical marijuana, right? Smoke a little dope and forget about all this? Uh, no, all I'm suggesting is maybe we just want to take this and smoke a little hope. And my wife begs me, as you guys probably will, take those two slides out of your presentation because it's really weird, but I think people need a, a break. So if we're not okay uh, with where we are, then we've got to decide we're not going to stay here. Talk about our opportunities. Emerging tech sectors. Out of 22 sectors of technology, Southern Oregon has 20. Nine of those are concentration levels equivalent to national averages, seven exceed. You know, without us really knowing about it, focusing on it, doing much to nurture it or leverage it, we've had this tech sector that's been coming on organically and hiding in plain sight. I feel like Indiana Jones, you guys. I feel like early this spring, I connected the dots and found the information that, that made perfect sense out of all this to validate it. One positive sign is our area's high tech sector output growth relative to the national average. So on that list where we've fallen from, from 12 to 114, and we're bringing up the rear, Wage growth 160, you know, job growth rather 160, wage growth 166. Look at this. We're number 12 for our five year high tech GDP growth. We've got a slightly lower concentration of high tech activity, uh, the rest of the country, but the diversity of those industries is greater than the national average. So a lot of communities yell, tech, tech, tech. And it's so much smoke and mirrors and wishful thinking because there's nothing really there to work with. And I'm telling you what, it is here in Jackson County. It's here to work with right now. How many high tech firms are represented in Southern Oregon? Most people, when I ask them that question in a public setting, they guess 5, 10, 15, 20. We have 277. It doesn't necessarily mean they're based here, they're represented here. This data comes from the Oregon Employment Department. They've got boots on the ground, somebody that's getting a paycheck. And that represents 2,753 jobs with an average wage of about $56,000, and I'll let you know that does not even include benefits. That's 150% of our median wage and $154 million in payroll. If you put a, a multiplier on there, three, that's about a half a, a half a billion dollar impact on our regional economy. This is the stats that validate this, and again, obtain this from the Oregon Employment Department. This is the uh, government day sector code on the left, the industry sector, the number of firms, uh, number of uh, uh, jobs, total payroll, and the average pay. So look at this line in Josephine County. This is Josephine County. Uh, they're so broke they almost can't afford to pay attention. We went down to two deputies on the sheriff's department. It's really unfortunate. But for electronic instrument fashion, there's three companies with 186 jobs, 15 million people. Those jobs average about $80,000 a pop. 
Economic development 101, what are our strengths? Let's leverage those. We've got three companies. I would consider that a cluster, almost 200 jobs that are 80,000 bucks a pop. Let's go get some more of those companies. These are the stats for Jackson County, and I aggregated those to get to the totals on the bottom. <coughs> Manufacturing, every manufacturing job we bring into our community, manufacturing historically has a 1.4 jobs multiplier. High tech manufacturing has a 4.3 jobs multiplier. It's a great opportunity to make up for lost time just by leveraging our tech sector. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. For computer systems design and related services, in 2003, we had about 100 people working in that, in that, that sector, making about $2,500 a month. Only 10 years later, We've doubled the workforce, and they have doubled their income to over 5000 a month. Point to any other sector of our economy and say, well, what could other sector like can we point to and say, you know what, the last two years we've doubled the workforce, and those folks have doubled their income. There's an example of some local tech companies. Stop the brain drain. Regardless, just historically, regardless of the level of education, the manufacturing sector pays more than the non-manufacturing sector. And what we're talking about here is populate our, our available industrial land. I'm telling you what, we've got a very limited inventory, as you know, of industrial land, but that's the bad news. The good news is it's still there. Most of it's been sitting vacant for decades. Matter of fact, uh, Reed Murphy sitting in this room uh, and his business partner bought some property out on Avenue G last year that I think is the premier state certified industrial site in the region. It's been sitting vacant since World War II. Backs up against the Denman, unobstructed views of the Table Rock, Mountain Laughlin, but it's just they're vac vacant decade after decade. I'm reminded of uh, Confucius. He said, man who stand on mountaintop with mouth wide open, wait a long time for most duck to drop in. <laughs> and we stand here in the flyover between the Silicon Valley and the Silicon Forest with literally billions of dollars flying overhead, hoping something's going to drop out of the sky on us, and it, and it doesn't. So right now, and, and these are the most current stats, unfortunately, the way they track this data, but it's pretty, it's pretty consistent year in, year out. There's the, there's, out of the eight Oregon universities, there's the number of students enrolled in each from Jackson to Josephine County. In particular, I'll bring to your attention the 308 to OIT. That's pretty consistent year in, year out. 5,700 kids from our county uh, get these educations, most of them paid for from people who are earning wages in this county, but most of them are going somewhere else because of the lack of opportunity. The point is we've got a technically educated workforce capacity that we've not tapped into. And a lot of these kids, I've spoken in high schools, a lot of these kids tell me, you better believe I'd stay here if there was a career path for me, and I could afford to stay here. But I'm telling you, only, only 12 years ago, you guys, when I moved here in 2002, Medford, Oregon was ranked the number one least affordable housing market in the United States of America in 2002 because of the disparity between our stagnant wages and our high real estate values. Okay? The equity refugee pipeline was open full throttle and people were coming up and they were just cashing out down there, paying cash up here, and it caused our real estate values to skyrocket, our wages stay stagnant. What that did is cause an uptick in the young people leaving the region because of a lack of opportunity and their ability to afford a home here. And even though our market overcorrected the economy tank because we were over-dependent upon that phenomenon, we're on that same trajectory right now based on our wages being the bottom 4% and, and housing uh, starts are down, equities are up in California. The house that I sold for $450,000 is a 1,540 square foot track house uh, 12 years ago. It was 30 years old at the time. Same houses in Fremont, California are selling for seven fifty right now. So now let's talk about our, our uh, strong tech economy. This is an article I'm sure you saw at the end of April. Uh, was, you know, it, it ran in El Tribune, and it came out on the day we so already had an a angel conference, and there was a, a, a venture capitalist by the name of Diane Framing, who was the MC and one of the keynote speakers. And I don't know if you're, any of you were there. I know Ron was. <laughs> Money, are you there? Okay, so Diane Framing, her opening comments were kind of to put some tough love on us to take our community to task and say, this is such a beautiful place to live. I don't get it. Why aren't you guys realizing your great potential? And so she went on like that for about 10 minutes, and at the break, I went up and introduced myself to her, and I said, Diane, there's actually some wonderful things going on with technology. And I said, uh, coincidentally, there's an article in today's paper about, uh, about this. I said, did you see it? She said, no. I said, I have to have a copy right here. So I gave it to her and told her some of those stats. And at the end of the break, Diane Frame, the venture capitalist from outside this community, shook that paper in everybody's face and read those statistics and said, this is exactly what we need to do. We've got a great entrepreneurial ecosystem here. The Mary Coffin Foundation ranks Medford's MSA number 16 out of 180 for entrepreneurialism. That's great. We're recognized by other people for having a great entrepreneurial ecosystem. 
We've got the Chamber, the wonderful for business advocacy, networking, and tourism. Uh, survey, tag team, revolving loan fund, the Enterprise Zones, the, the Edge Campaign, uh, doing some great work there. Uh, Sustainable Valley has a business accelerator that actually attracted a company out of MIT that had their separate discussions with you, you understand that. Uh, Jefferson Grapevine, uh, thanks to Steve Vincent, uh, Jefferson Grapevine and, and the uh, Angel Investment Network, and we've got our SPDCs. But it looks to me, you guys, trying to be objective about this, our system is not firing on all cylinders. Because if it was, we wouldn't be on the bottom 4% for the lowest wages of the country. We wouldn't be having this conversation. The first part of this presentation would tell a different story. Here's a few slides that show some of our challenges. State and local individual tax collections, with one being bad, Oregon is number five. We actually rank worse than California. What I can't find and I'm looking for is a site that will aggregate the impact of a sales tax or not having one, because I think if that was aggregated, we would actually have a better, better ranking. Tax free today it starts to get a little better. Uh, with one being bad, California's number four, we're number 16. Combined state and local sales tax, we don't have one, but neither do two other states, so we tie for 47. California is number eight. I'm totally focused on California right now. You, uh, you guys obviously understand why. This shows the affordability gap uh, between the Silicon Valley and the Rogue Valley. Right now, it's really in our favor. But if real estate values continue to skyrocket, this will not be this will not be the case. A seventy thousand dollar job here would only pay about ninety one thousand in the Bay Area, but you need one hundred and seven to maintain your standard of living. I think the gap is actually a lot wider than that because I've been down there lately. But I'm telling you, the median price again, in Fremont, California, $476 a square foot. We're 128, 28 cents on the dollar. They're paying $2,500 a month for a two-bedroom apartment, which is about 800 a year. Crazy. State, state business tax climate. You know, as much as uh, I'm as guilty as anybody else in this community is of saying, Oregon is so not friendly to business, and either is Jackson County. I'm sure you guys hear that all the time. And either is Medford, really? I'm, I'm, I'm not drinking that negative Kool-Aid anymore. With one being good, Oregon almost makes the top 10 for business taxation. We're number 12. California's 48. You guys know that's the eighth largest economy in the world, California, if it was its own nation. Matter of fact, if the Silicon Valley was its own nation, it would have the 19th largest GDP in the world. There's our opportunity. Overall business ranking, 17 for Oregon is nothing to write home about. We could do better than that. But it's a whole lot better than California, which is number 47. I got this from the United Bandline site. I thought it was very interesting. 2000 migration, 2013 migration patterns of United Bandline's customers. The number one state for moving into was Oregon. So <laughs> people are coming here. I mean, when I ask when I ask this question at Rotary, I'll say, hey, look, let's have a little group therapy here. If you have passed through California, maybe you're not a native of California, but at some point in time in your life before you got here, you passed through there, raise your hand. And I have a group about in half the room. It's like, that's part of keeping Oregon green. It's going to happen. The question is, who do we want to attract? This shows you that in 2000, 2010, there was a, more than 150,000 Californians that migrated into Oregon, representing more than $4 billion in income. So my proposal is relatively simple, you guys. Our workforce before the uh, Great Recession was about 85,000. Our workforce is at the end of 2013, and this will be updated at the end of 2014. Uh, we're, as of the end of 2013, we're still down close to 7,000 jobs that have not been regained since the economy came. So I'm proposing something really, relatively simple. Our current workforce is 78,000 with a median wage of 37,000. We have about $3 billion in income in Jackson County right now. If we targeted a 1% increase, which I think is very attainable, a 1% increase in our workforce over the next five years, but that 1% was based upon our top five high-tech high sectors. Those top five high-tech sectors pay about $64,000. That would be $50 million in additional income in the Valley. There's a 4.3 jobs multiplier, and I know this is the Rogue Valley, it's not the Silicon Valley, that multiplier is not likely to be as high here, but just say it was, that'd be another 3,300 jobs at 37,000. That's 127 million. You've got the potential for 177 million dollars in additional income in this valley over the next five years just by growing the tech sector by one percent, uh, by growing our workforce by one percent, focused on the tech sector. That's about a six percent increase in income for every business dependent upon what happens here. Top five high tech sectors. There they are. And really, look at software in particular that averages about 64,000. We've got a lot of software uh, and skill in this valley. Don Beckman, Motorcycle USA, is not considered a high-tech firm. Don has got about 30 software developers. They're all making about six figures. 
So the point is, we've got dozens, several dozens, if not hundreds of other software developers in this valley that aren't even represented in these statistics. Software is something we do really well. So my, my, my plan, again, I'm looking for three stakeholders. And I'm not reinventing the wheel here. Uh, Steve Vincent is very familiar with what I'm talking about in the sense that uh, he actually owes this individual. There's a gentleman by the name of Bob Potter who moved from Southern California up to Northern Idaho years ago. I look at him as best-in-class modeling. He worked with the, the system that existed in that region to, to recruit about 75 to 80 businesses from Southern California all the way up to Northern Idaho and Eastern Washington. My wife and I looked at that region. It was number two on our list of moving here. But we said, it's too cold <laughs> for too long. It's too remote. But you know what? Bob was able to overcome those objections and get people to go all the way from Southern California to Northern Idaho. And I think we've got an even better story to tell than that. So why not reverse engineer exactly what he did, lay it over the valley, and go after our top five high-tech sectors? It seems like a pretty simple strategy. So three stakeholders that would contribute somewhere in the range of ninety to $100,000 a year each. And what I'm offering is, uh, oops, the performance metrics. I'm saying I'm going to do tremendous research and make an outreach to 200 companies a year. Okay, I'm not going to just sit here and wait for something to happen. You know, stand on the mountaintop and wait for the roast duck to drop in. I'm actually going to identify. There's a, there's a, a very simple way to do this. Identify these companies that will fit within the fabric of what we, we're already doing here, would fit within the fabric of our community. Identify and contact 200 companies a year. Of those 200, I know that I'll be able to, to visit with 40. I'm absolutely confident about that because I did my homework. These are the people that are going to be open. Privately held, traded sector companies that provide family wages that are the right size for fitting in our valley. Okay? Uh, of those, I believe I'll be able to get 20 to visit the region. And of those, I believe we'll get about a 2% close rate on the 200, which is four companies a year. And I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. So even if we just target, say, 50 employees, here's what's going to happen. And I'm, and I'm already having conversations in the Bay Area with, with people like this. Probably half their workforce it has a home, and if they've had it more than three years, they're equity rich, they're in a great position, okay? The other half are probably locked out of the market and may never get a home. Okay, so if you go back down to a privately held company that has 50 to 100 employees after you come up here, fall in love with the area, and decide you're going to relocate your firm and talk to them, I'll bet half of them are going to say, I'm in. That quality of life, that, that affordability, I'm in. Let's go. So 50 jobs out of four companies would be 200, 200 jobs a year over a five year period. That's 1,000 jobs. Even if we only had half of that, that's 500 high tech jobs. And look at the impact it could have on our community. And to the stakeholders, I'm, I'm trying to get a very small group of stakeholders because I think if you have too many stakeholders, you'll be holding to too many people with too many different agendas and too many different expectations, right? And you get yourself spread too thin to be effective in these things. So to the stakeholders, the very select group, I'm offering total transparency, monthly updates, quarterly reports, and a direct involvement in effect as a board uh, to shepherd how this happens. What's in for Jackson County? The video culture proceeds. Now that they don't need to go into the libraries anymore, congratulations, because that was a masterful move uh, so that the county is no longer responsible for libraries. My daughter, thank you. My daughter, who won the reading contest in Jackson County, by the way, this summer for reading 45 books, we love the libraries. Okay, we're good, we're good, Carrie, our share of that. But now that we don't have to put it there, I'm just asking for maybe a 10 to 12% commitment as Jackson County being one of three stakeholders for this, for this, uh, for this proposition. Jackson County Public uh, Health. Increase strength of the regional economy, reduce county expenditures, and dependence on federal health care federal health care funds. You know, why just because the feds are willing to get the checkbook out and, and cover all these expenses, I question, should we have a mindset of, of uh, entitlement ourselves and we're just dependent upon the Fed to take care of our community instead of doing what we can to get a better foundation of wage family wage jobs with employers that provide insurance? Jackson County Fairgrounds. A stronger economic multiplier means people are going to have more cash in their pocket to support the events that the, that the fairgrounds have. As a matter of fact, the public will have nicer events, and, and it could become totally self-sustaining. Remind and I've spoke with Dan and some of you about this, but it reminds me an opportunity with some of the land that's available to develop some sort of a small business park, wherein uh, that that facility can be totally self-sustaining. <coughs> Leverage. There's other stakeholders that are not currently involved and engaged in in economic development, as such as I'm proposing here. And I think there's a way to leverage the county's contribution with other stakeholders that I've already spoken with that are very interested in supporting this, so that we have an adequate resource capacity to actually do this in the way that it needs to be done. Tax revenue. Again, there's a whole new street. What, what other plan besides besides offloading things like the libraries? 
uh, on, the, on, on, the, on the voters, which is fine. But besides that, what are the plans are to create new streams of tax revenue? Right now, and I found out, but again, I, I asked Andrew this question, how much tax revenue is Jackson County getting for every acre of vacant industrial lands, $500? How much tax revenue would Jackson County get for every $1 million in capital improvements? $2,000. What do you, <laughs> open book question. Who do you think invests more in capital improvements? A high tech firm or a shipping and receiving outfit? Right? We look at the Ferry Moore uh, Seed Company that was here briefly. They had a 100,000 square foot plus facility with about 20 jobs or so. A 100,000 square foot facility could accommodate about 300 tech jobs. Uh, jobs, our community needs them, it's, it's the right thing to do, you guys get that. Uh, collaboration, uh, you know, the, re the existing system needs to be retooled. I don't think anybody disputes that. We might have different views on how that's going to happen. And I think I've got the, the energy and the passion and the vision and the, you know, the collaboration to get it done. So the things that, that are unique about uh, my proposal, leverage, there's a way to leverage other stakeholders to engage in this, uh, many of which I've already spoken with. That are in, in a, Agreeing to look at this very seriously. Stakeholder reimbursement. There's something that's also very unique. I'm actually going to go ahead and get a real estate license. And the purpose of getting out a real estate license, that if I can build the trust and the relationship with these companies and it'll allow me to represent them to broker or sale or lease, then I want to be able to take that income and reimburse the stakeholders. And what I want to do is be able to reimburse them up to 50% of what I actually make on an annual basis so that within about a five year period of time, this position is self sustaining. That they no longer need to come to you and have this conversation. We'll just be talking about, you know, how do you, <laughs> how do you spend the tax revenue that you got? How do we invest that? Collaboration, performance metrics, and jobs. Uh, I think we've got we, not me, we. You know, they say you can see a lot further when you stand on somebody else's shoulders. So I want to thank each of you and these guys and these chairs too for allowing me to stand on your shoulders to be able to see even further than I would on my own. We can do this. So that is it, gentlemen, and I would be uh, delighted to answer any questions you've got and hopefully brainstorm a little bit up here. Why don't you turn on the lights, Mark, would you form please? Thank you. Gentlemen? Um, I have questions. Yes. Mark, have you done the, I'm sure you've probably done the math. On the commitment that you're asking from the county, have you compared that to, let's assume we have the um, five tech firms come and, and, they, and they build a you know, facility that costs X number. We live and die on property taxes. So the property taxes that that would generate plus the people, let's assume that 50 people come in and, and buy a new home. So we have the property taxes from 50 new homes. Have you compared that? I mean, how does that factor into the... You know, all, all I can say is if we look at, you know, the amount of capital improvements that are made for high tech is significantly more, and I know it's two thousand dollars per million dollars of capital improvements that are invested. So it's significantly more, and I could certainly run the numbers on that to give a model of what it would look like. But I think that there's, there's, you know, it's not just that particular company that moves in. There's this halo effect of prosperity because other companies are going to be able to benefit from what they do and expand and do new things. So we can start to populate our industrial land that's been sitting vacant for decades and create whole new streams of revenue. So I'm not able to answer your question directly because I haven't ran those numbers, but I will. Well, there's so many other fingers too. You can also say that when people are employed, there's less crime, and so you need to factor all that in too. Exactly. I was just curious. And less dependent on, on, on social services, etc. Correct. We're, we're way over dependent upon that. I mean, right now, um, I won't, the, the names shall remain, uh, I'll withhold the names to protect the innocent here, but there's a particular nonprofit health care provider in our community, um, and there's a particular, let's say, value-added food production company without naming names that came to the region, has got about a thousand jobs. Well, I, for this nonprofit health care provider, a few years ago they were doing an expansion at Central Point, and so I went to them and I said, call your database and find out how many of your patients are employees of this particular company, and how many patient visits have they received and what, to what cost. Well, here's what happened. This was about six years ago. They had about 70 of their, of their employees and family members who had received close to 500 patient visits, 480, uh, to the cost of about $8,000. So I went to that COO of that company and said, welcome to the Valley, we're so glad you're here, there's nothing but good we can say, right? We're, we're, we're just delighted, et cetera, et cetera. I said, but if you're ever, you know, I said, my understanding is in your industry, and correct me if I'm wrong, the, the margins are so tight, there's not a lot of money left over for benefits, and medical benefits for your employees. And he didn't say, well, that's true for others, but not for us. He just listened. 
And I said, you know, for example, we've got a nonprofit here who's been helping out your employees and their families. And I told them all the stats. And I said, so what do you think about writing a check for ten thousand dollars a year for commitment to help these guys for like three years? You know what they got? The goose egg. And that's when I kind of went ballistic in myself and started rocking the boat. Almost got kicked off the board of So Ready, which I still might now. Uh, but I almost got kicked off the board of So Ready because I was really out of my comfort zone. At that point, I was just livid. It's like, are you kidding me? We're going to focus. I know there's no such thing as a bad job, but if our focus is to bring more value added food production to this valley, the median manufacturing for food production in the state of Oregon is about $30,000 fully loaded. That's more than 20% below our current low median. Is there an economic multiplier there? Probably, but I think it's more of a divider because those folks can't afford to sustain the basic needs of life. And the rest of us get calls on a regular basis about charity auctions and things like that. There's major donor fatigue trying to subsidize people's existence. I don't think that's the right strategy when the median manufacturing wage in this state is twice that, $60,000. Let's raise the bar. So let me answer your question a little yeah. bit about residential. I have looked at all the numbers. Residential development actually costs the county money because our tax rate is so low that more development means additional people per household, or additional household with the same number of people that we average. So it's, our, it's a function of our tax rates that's the problem there. The only place where the county actually gains is in industrial development, and sometimes in commercial development, mostly in industrial, where the actual tax base generated is enough to support the additional 50 families that may move here, uh, but the residential side doesn't. And, and if, I, I totally agree with that. Here's, if you look at the projections for Jackson County's increase in population, we're going to grow anyway. The question is, with what demographic? If we continue to get equity refugees, we're at the front of the silver tsunami of the baby boomers retiring that are primarily retired. There's folks going to be buying those new houses because the young people in this valley can't afford to. They're going to get pushed out of the valley. When, in fact, if we populate our vacant industrial land with family wage jobs, we could create a whole little economic development ecosystem because those people could afford to buy our price, our housing. I've got residential developers telling me they think that the young people, as a matter of fact, people in this community can't afford to buy their lots, let alone build the homes. It's primarily going to people outside of the area. And at the end of this, at the end of this brochure, you'll see a number of support letters from those very people. They're saying that, not me. Doug? You got a lot of statistics, and we can get mired down in the statistics all day long, and, and everybody, you know. Your sixty grand that you're asking for, then you mentioned a ninety grand. Was there's a discrepancy there? So yeah. you mentioned something else about another thirty grand, but you didn't really identify what that was. And so you're saying that you want five grand a month, sixty grand a year, to be able to be one third of a partnership with who? First question. Yes. Has anybody else? signed on at this point? You're the first ones I've approached on this level. Okay. I've had this discussion with numerous other potential stakeholders who are very interested in their, and right now. Again, there's letters back in the back of this that are indicating that they're looking at this right now. Second. And so there's the most to gain from them. And answering your question, I had the same question, the same conversation with Roy Vineyard, the CEO of Asante. I said, Roy, how's that payer mix working out? He said, it's not. I said, anything on your radar that's going to get better? He said, no. I said, has anybody from this community ever asked you that question? He said, no. I said, so nobody's ever offered a partner for you to make it better? He said, no. I said, didn't you guys have a meeting this year that said one of the three things that's got to happen to improve, improve the quality of health care is, is grow the economy a better job? He said, yeah. I said, would you like to have that conversation? He said, yeah. So they're, they're very interested. See, so you're looking at other partners. Yes. Who are the first ones you've approached. 60 grand buys the buy-in. What's the other 34? The $60,000 the 60, is basically my income to give me, you know, I've been trying to help uh, matter of fact, Ron Fox told me when I, you know, my two-year term is over as board president for So Ready, and he's sitting right here, so he can tell you whether he said this or not. He said, Mark, in So Ready's history, nobody's ever helped the organization as much as you have. And even though what I'm doing right now may be perceived otherwise, I'm still that same guy trying to help this organization. So what I need, I need, is full-time bandwidth. I mean, I'm trying to do this with 5% of my bandwidth. It's never going to happen. So what I need is the, is the bandwidth, uh, Commissioner, to be able to do this full time and to execute that plan and to develop this performance metrics and actually deliver on that. And if I don't, you know, hold me accountable. If I don't deliver on that metrics, then, then say, well, it was a nice experience. We should, we should have to try something, but it didn't work. So that gives me the full time bandwidth. And it also gives me the resources to go down to the valley and to the LA basin, very strategic, very targeted groups I'm going after, and then to actually bring them back up here. Is that the 60 or the 30? I'm still not that clear with the, the other 30. Is, the 60 is basically my income. Okay. And my, my, my wife is going to, you know, we're, 
We're an excellent team. She's a wonderful administrator. So she's going to do all the backup and the administrative support uh, for, for this. So basically that's going to be our income, our insurance, benefits, you know, retirement, uh, a vehicle for this purpose, etc. And then the thirty to $40,000 is the stakeholder contribution to the expenses associated with traveling down there. Primarily getting the business tools that I need to execute on this and then traveling down to the Silicon Valley and uh, LA and then bringing those folks back up here. I'm not going to waste people's money, Commissioner. If I'm going down to the Silicon Valley, I will drive. Okay? If I'm driving, I'm going to LA, I'm going to fly. But when it comes to bringing those people back up here, I really want them to have a wonderful time. You know, the, the strategy is relatively simple. If they come up in the evening time, the first night's going to be dinner uh, at the appropriate person's home or restaurant with the appropriate people there. The next day is going to be all about them having fun, doing whatever they want to do, and to find out in advance that they want golf, rafting, fishing, zip line, wineries, whatever they want to do, Shakespeare. And then the next day we'll talk business and we'll send them home. And, and, and Bob Potter says it's a three year commitment. That's why I'm talking about a five-year runway. It's a three-year commitment from the time you first make contact with the company to the time you're putting a shovel in the ground, and you have to touch those companies seven to eight times. And that doesn't mean on the phone or in the email. It means actually meeting with them. I'm going to be in town next week. Why don't we get together to do lunch or coffee? And there's some new information. You know, we got another company that came to town, or this development, and we've got these great incentives packages or whatever. You're always finding out more information that you can feed them, and uh, it's, a, it's about a three-year process. Good. Now, uh, last few weeks we received a, a presentation from So Radio about something very similar, a site recruiter, business recruiter type position. What makes, basically I see a competition between the two of you coming out at this point in time, which competition is healthy, it, it, has the, it spurs conversation if nothing else. Um, what makes you better than So Ready? You know, you put, put me in a. <laughs> I'm going to flat ask. You're not putting me in a difficult position. The question puts me in a I'm, difficult position. I'm going to flat ask. I've got question. somebody sitting right here. I, you know, and I'm going to ask the same one of them if you want to sit down and listen. So, it, it, <laughs> what makes you better than so ready? Why, why the investment with you over an established organization that's been here for a long time? So, I mean, tell me, tell me what's going on. I don't know. I think if we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always got. We'll always be where we've always been. You know, and, and constru in the construction business, there's all different sorts of tools. And there's all different, even with saws, there's all different types of saws. You can build a house with a handsaw, you can build this build with a hand, with a handsaw. It's going to take an extremely long time. So there's always a modernization and update um, on how things are developed and tools that are made for the, for the purpose of getting the job done more effectively, productively, more profitably. And so I believe that what I'm talking about, myself, me as a person, as a resource for this valley, and this plan is another tool in the same tool chest that can work in a very complementary way with SoReady. I don't see it being competing against SoReady. I look at this as competing with SoReady in a very cooperative type of a fashion. I've already actually brought somebody from SoReady and from Business already down to Northern California to meet with the tech company that I made an outreach to. And I'll tell you what, I was concerned that we would come across as being dysfunctional because we had, you know, like we're in competition or something, but it was a wonderful meeting. And, but it's a bit of a numbers game. It's not like everyone you meet is going to just automatically come up here. And so I feel like there's a way to work together in a very symbiotic way to leverage the resources and to bring them in where they fit. But I would rather be nimble <laughs> so I'm not beholden to a board and a bureaucratic system. And I know I'm in the middle of a bureaucratic system right now, but I look at you guys and say, you're not bureaucrats. You're private sector guys who stepped into the system to help make a difference. And that's what I want to do. And I look at, again, somebody else that did this, and it's like, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So I think, I, I think also, Commissioner, the fact that I'm willing to, get, to grow this position to be self-sustaining, where I'm not just asking for this money on a, on a regular basis, you know, 15, 20 years from now, and I think that's, I think that's duplicatable. I think I can find somebody else in the valley. You know, I, I just turned 52, and I know I'm still a youngster. I used to say you can't put gray hairs on a young man's head, but it's like, now my head's full of I can't say that. So my point is, my point is in this that I think this is very duplicatable, and I think that I'll be able to find somebody else. I've got about ten years of this level of energy, and I, I, this is how I want to invest it because I think it's a very proactive way to help our community and, and leverage my talents and my energy. Other people see me that way too. So what? Uh, 
Tell me again your the, the bottom line of your ask. Give me give me all the numbers. So it's it's a it's five thousand dollars a month uh, stipend basically, and then it's going to be thirty to forty thousand dollars a year annually with the expenses. And again, I'll, I'll give receipts for the shareholders' share of the, of the corresponding cost, so everybody's getting those. And again, there'll be monthly updates, there'll be quarterly reports, there'll be total accountability. So you're looking at a hundred grand a year. Ninety to one hundred thousand dollars, Commissioner. And if we look at what we're you know potentially investing, at, what twenty five hundred dollars per job that we're offering people to create new jobs in the valley, I would question. What kind of jobs and what's the ROI and what's it doing to change the bottom line in our community? So this is actually less than that if you look at it for, on a per job basis, and we're talking about a significant family wage jobs. It's about 172 percent of our median wage. I'm talking about how much money you're asking to come out of the county's coffers. Sure. That's my math. Yes, sir. And you said with that, it's about four businesses is what you're guaranteeing. There, there. You know, if we don't do something, I think there's a risk here. Can I say, you know, my, my crystal ball reception is just as fuzzy as yours. What are you gonna have for breakfast tomorrow? I don't know, you know, what, what's tomorrow going to hold? I think the risk of doing nothing is greater than the risk of doing something. And if there's a performance metrics there, and if it's based on best in class modeling, we're absolutely going to get the return. It's about a three year timeline to build the pipeline and to get that companies actually starting to come. But once that pipeline is built and the system's in place, and if you maintain that consistency of the outreach and the touch, and contacting all those companies. The number of companies you contact is probably going to start to decrease as you start to get a fish on. You're going to start looking at all the other poles that are in the water and go focus on landing that fish, right? And so, guarantee, that would be presumptuous of me to say, yes, I absolutely guarantee it. Just look at your numbers. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the projection. I think it's very realistic. John. Mark, do you need all three stakeholders to make it work? All three stakeholders to commit to the investment? Ideally, I think otherwise what we've got is a continuation of a self-fulfilled prophecy of self-imposed limitations. If we have adequate resource capacity, so we're not so strapped for cash, and we can't afford to go down there as soon as we need to, we can't afford to bring them back up here as soon as we need to, and, and first-class accommodations and treat them right, you're never going to set a chance to make the first impression. If there's sufficient resource capacity to do that, We'll get the results. If we're on a shoestring budget and it's like, well, we got you a commercial flight at SFO. I know it's going to take you two hours to get there, and gosh, you know, they might even be canceled. I, you know, that's, I don't think that's putting the best foot forward. So your your performance projections are based on all three stakeholders. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And it might be, you know, right now I've got uh, the development community saying, hey, we should step up and, and cover that because we've got this land that's been sitting vacant forever and we've got a lot to gain. So the development community is saying we should step up and maybe split a stakeholder position. I love basically commissioners, who's got the best return on investment opportunity for the investment they would make to actually do this? And the county was at the top of the list because of the tax revenue issue. Well, as you as you all know, we're, we're looking at uh, different ways to... Uh, to uh, encourage uh, economic development here you're right we all three of us ran on the platform to kind of do that and, and it's been a tough tough hold given the environment and such but our, our issue is is we have we have limited amount of funds public money public I want to underline the word public <coughs> uh, taxpayers money to use as judiciously as we possibly can and and there is some I won't say disingenuous, but the, the, you say there's not any competition, and we're, we're going to try to make a decision somewhere about how we how we think best fit to spend X amount of dollars, whatever that X number represents, of public money to get the best results. So, so it's not it's not like we had a large pile of money. We don't Jackson County doesn't have a doesn't have a transit tax. It doesn't have a lot of things that that well, I'm tired of hearing about band all the time. They're entirely structured differently than we are. We have finite dollars, so how do we spend it best? So we're going to have to make a decision, Mark. I mean, quite honestly, and, and it is a competition about do we do we put X amount here and, and here? And, and one of the issues that uh, that uh, well, like when was so ready, for example, and I'll say it with them with, that, with them here in the room, is that something you just mentioned a little bit ago is that. How much you need money? It takes money to make money, right? Okay, they've been underfunded forever. So that's what I'm saying. So do we? So we decide to, to, to fertilize one one organization or another organization. Where do we think we're going to get the best growth? And that's a, that's our that's our, our difficulty here. And if I could, Commissioner, offer for consideration maybe a compromise. You know, I I read Sorey's proposal and what they they've asked of the county, and maybe the compromise is 
they do need additional funding. Uh, again, that's one of the things that almost got me kicked off the board before you guys were here. I went to the other county commissioners and, and, and showed them out of 13 counties that had economic development enterprises, Jackson County was dead last at 2.6% of those video poker proceeds invested in Sorbet, for example, in the state. So Sorbet is woefully underfunded to accomplish the mission that everyone expects it to accomplish. But what I'm proposing is, you know, give them the additional funding, and if you would consider, an alternative is to fund me as the high-tech business recruitment mercenary, not just for business in general, not just for developing the Edge campaign and then sitting by a phone waiting for somebody to call in response to it, but actually proactively, strategically, and aggressively going out and locating and making contact with these companies and bringing them up here. Other communities do that, and they do really well. We haven't done it, and so we haven't done well. These companies are leading anyway. There's a trend right now, Commissioner. There's a trend right now for businesses, like in the Silicon Valley, it's a very expensive place to do business, the LA Basin, etc. There's a trend right now for businesses to leave the strike force they need there and take the rest of it somewhere else. And those communities that understand that are standing in line. And here's another difference. They're standing in line and say, hey, on your way out of, out of uh, Silicon Valley, we talked about Reno or Sparks or Bend or Boise or Spokane or whatever. And they're saying, yeah, we're leaving anyway. I don't, want, I don't want it just to be dependent upon site consultants. I've made contact with dozens of site consultants, but those site consultants typically represent a client that is looking at multiple communities. And in each respective community, there's multiple developers. So what I'm talking about is not standing in line with site consultants, not standing in line with those companies we heard are leaving anyway, but actually proactively going out there and engaging and starting the conversation, initiating and controlling the conversation. It's a totally different approach, totally different mindset. Any other questions or comments? No. Doug? So if I understand you correctly, you're looking for about ninety dollars to $100,000 a year for a three-year commitment? Yes. Uh, what I've asked for is a five-year commitment. It's three years to get the pipeline built according to the best-in-class modeling. It's three years before, on average. There can be companies that come sooner, and that's the nice thing about reaching out for privately held companies that are easier to get to the decision makers. So you're looking at a half million dollars total over five years, and right. then at that and, point and in time, again, you're saying I'm not it, delivering on the metrics. At that point in time, you're saying it becomes self-sufficient. Yeah, that's my target. I say within five to ten years, but I think realistically, I could get there within five years. So I have a uh, question, uh, Danny. On, uh, I'm assuming if, if in Mark's proposal, I don't know this some sort of wrong thing to do, but you'd be looking for some sort of contract because you're, you don't want to be going off thinking you're going to and then the money dries up and, and you're left high and dry. Correct. As you well know, that we have we have an issue with our with budget with our money is we can't commit a following budget committee dollars. Now, if we had a signed contract, that's my question. If we had a contract, how would, how would that work? So, typically, um, we can obligate ourselves beyond the fiscal year, but the contracts always have a non-appropriation clause uh, that's required by Oregon law, uh, so it's not just because we want one. But so what that means is if the future board decides not to appropriate funds for it, the contract no longer binds us. Um, however, there's some penalty to the county for doing that. It affects our bond rating or our ability to borrow on credit because we essentially defaulted by not appropriating. So. A, board, a future board could get out of it, but there would be consequences. If you did, you know, t typically professional services, which is what I would assume this is under, assuming that Mark creates some kind of formal business structure, probably at least an LLC, assuming that he carries the required insurance policy to indemnify the county, uh, then typically we would consider it a professional services, and it's exempt from. Uh, competitive bidding. However, the board's position has typically been when we're going to seek a professional service like an architect or an attorney or something uh, that we typically do go out and let a request for proposals. And I'm not saying that Mark wouldn't be good at what he's doing, but there may be someone out there who has a better idea who will do it for cheaper at, for the public money and so typically there's a competition. We, we don't usually just contract with someone because they come in and make a proposal to the board. We can, uh, and you know, there's perceptions that go along with that. And in this case, because it's not required to be, it's not subjected to local contract review board rules, exempted as a professional service, you could just direct staff to prepare a contract to do that. 
Anything else? Okay. No. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Joe. Okay. That's the discussion of Southern Oregon Regional Economic Developments. So ready. Funding. Uh, based on the proposal that we heard uh, about a month ago uh, from So Ready. So Ron, would you come to the table, please, sir? <coughs> and if you'd like to have Monty and Steve come up, they, they can, you gentlemen can as well. I always like uh, my strong backs. A little reinforcement, sure. That's right. That's right. <laughs> my muscle. So th this is... Uh, the, uh, and I appreciate sensitivity and, 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 and the uncomfortableness of the situation. And I hope Mark stays for this, uh, for your presentation. Again, that's up to him. He's more than welcome to stay, obviously. Uh, but we, we've heard, we've heard, uh, Ron, your your proposal uh, that you and Bill and uh, Matt made to us. Like I said, I think it's about a month ago. And we said at that time that we would take some time for consideration and such. And then since that time, then Mark has, has come forward and, uh, uh, and asked to be able to make a formal presentation to the full board. And we felt that that would be appropriate as well. Again, as I said just a few moments ago, uh, we're in a, a situation where, number one, do we want to participate in any uh, large-scale uh, uh, funding of money? Uh, for economic development uh, over the little piddly amount that's an editorial <laughs> now, uh, or, or, or step up and, and do something uh, on, a, on a larger scale looking for obviously uh, greater greater results so I don't mean this to be a uh, you know a back and forth and, and a, a debate or anything. We've heard Mark's proposal. I'd like to have you go ahead and, and just uh, briefly, since we're familiar with your proposal, uh, but just briefly go over that again. And, and what makes uh, your request for a little over $200,000 total, given that, say, that amount, that uh, including that amount that we've already, that generous amount that we already provide, uh, <laughs> What, what makes what, what why why should we pay so much attention? Well, thanks, commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to join you again. I, well, I think uh, um, I'll just say right up front. Uh, uh, Mark's proposal is is in my mind pretty much the same proposal I made to you for a portion of the hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. Essentially, we we to we be successful have to uh, substantially increase our effort to attract new business investments to gen to build our economy. Uh, we have a strong component in Serenity right now. Um, the, the, the list of 277 high-tech businesses that exist within the region, uh, those are the companies that Serenity visits with on a regular basis. Those are the companies that we work with uh, as part of, I mentioned earlier, we make about 100 outreach calls to businesses within the region, that's Jackson and Josephine County each year. Those companies are part of that. So we're very familiar with what constitutes those high-tech firms. We're also familiar with what constitutes the other major categories of, of traded sector businesses in, in Jackson County, whether it be manufacturing, electronic commerce, uh, especially agriculture, and, a, and a, a number of other sectors. Um, I think one of the differences, our proposal to you, I will say, is based on the best insight we have been able to garner from people in this business of economic development. There is easily 2,500 to 3,000 communities across the United States that have essentially the same objective as we're talking about here, a better economy, higher wages, more, more economic stability. Um, as you know, and as you, you members of the commission have participated, we have, been engaged, we have engaged in effort to learn more about the process by which businesses choose locations, what are they looking for, and how do we compare to those expectations through our annual site consultant tours? And as Mark mentioned, these are folks who represent businesses. Um, years ago, I called this initiative a 10x strategy. Uh, that being that if you can make a relationship with one consultant, each of those consultants has to have at least 10 consultants. Or excuse me, have to have 10 business clients that they're working with. That's the only way they can sustain themselves. So we talk to one person, we're talking to 10 or more businesses in that effort. And in addition to showing them what we have available and what we can, what our uh, communities and our uh, local governments and everything else has to offer, 
we've learned a tremendous amount from them about how those businesses are making those processes. Our Southern Oregon Edge, the business recruitment marketing campaign, is really built on what they shared with us. They say, focus on what you are your strengths. Focus on the businesses and the individuals that make up your economy. Because that's what people that's the first thing a business prospect is going to ask about if they come visit the areas. Let me talk to somebody who's like me in your community. I want to know how they're doing with the, their in relationship with the county governments. So I think the major difference is you're getting a sinister A to Z economic development effort effort from Serretti. This this is what um, I and my board of directors and Steve and Monty are here today. Matt and Bill uh, were here with you previously. This is what we have presented and discussed with our board, and, and that's their support. Uh, I would say also that. Uh, when asked if you were to ask me that question, so who are your other partners in funding this effort? Um, I can I would provide to you a list of our a, a, uh, sustaining executive and underwriter members. Those are the organizations and individuals that are putting their money into the same objectives that we're asking you to increase your commitment to. So I think that's. I'll stop at that point and then okay. answer your question. I'd like to ask uh, both Monty and Steve, uh, I mean, giving them the, the two utility people here that, I mean, that economic development is, is their bread and butter. And uh, I'd like to get your perspective. I'd like to hear the, have the board, all of us here, your perspective as professional um, BD folks, quite honestly. So whoever wants to start, please do. Uh, you know, seniority first. <laughs> I don't know if I like that. <laughs> it's tenure on the job. Oh, tenure on the job. Yeah, okay. That's right. That's what I meant. Well, well, utilities are kind of the canary in the mind. In the mind, if, uh, if the economy is struggling locally, our revenues struggle as well. So we've got a vested interest in an economy that's vibrant. So we've been involved, or I've been involved in economic development for 17 years now, uh, 15 of those years here in Jackson County. I've been the past president of So Ready and been on the board ever since. Uh, you know, it seems like we go in cycles too in the, in the community. A lot of it depends on the local economy or the national or regional economy as well. When I first got here in 2000, uh, the issue was you're not doing enough to recruit business we want to do something different. And there was a group of people in the business community that wanted to do something different. And they would actually talk about splintering the organization at that point. We brought in Audrey Chabin, uh, or Audrey Taylor with Chabin uh, Concepts. They came up with a plan to actually increase the recruitment activities. Now, the economy was perking along pretty good at that time. There was some opportunity if we put more resource into it. Since then, we've had a severe downturn in the economy. Nobody's moving. Everybody's sitting on their wallets. That happened for several years since 07. Basically, we really focused on existing businesses and trying to retain them and to expand those. And entrepreneurial efforts starts up here. Start up here locally. Well, we're starting to see some activity now. You're starting to see some uh, recruitments uh, from Business Oregon. We're seeing some of those that we're able to foster ourselves through the organization. And now is really the time to try to again, invest more in the recruitment side, which is what this proposal is all about, based on solid information we have from nationally acclaimed recruiters and site finders, uh, to expand again. And this is what this is really all about. The other piece of it, the other $50,000, is about how do we foster local businesses, and Steve deserves a tremendous amount of, of uh, recognition with the Angel Investment Network, how do we keep those dollars here locally? Because the last go around, uh, we didn't have businesses that were, were really prepared and competitive with some of the outside businesses to be able to garner those resources locally here, which a lot of the investors, investors and partners want to do uh, with uh, the you fostered with the Angel Investment Network. So that's kind of the components of this thing here, and, and that's why we're supportive of it. As utilities, we really need a good, vibrant economy. It, it's good for our business as well. It's good for our business. <coughs> I would just add that the reason, I, the, the, between the, my first presentation to you, I, I, internally I've sort of come back and said, really, I'm making two S. One is for business recruitment, and one is for the entrepreneurial business development. But if you look at, at our history of what makes up our traded sector businesses, whether they be high tech or manufacturing, many of those, probably well over half of them, are really were started by an entrepreneur who, for whatever reason, grew up here, came here and loved it, never left created those businesses and now they, they, they have grown to be a substantial part of our economy. These two things go together, they're just one is reaching out for those opportunities, the other was reach, reaching internally mm -hmm. to that and 
Um, and I'll, I'm going to set up the Steve comment because without good prospects, good business ideas, the angel investor group, there's a million places for those people to invest their dollars. We, we have got to do a better job of developing the growing businesses, uh, business concepts for them to invest in. Steve? Well, I guess, uh, again, for the record, Steve Vincent representing Invest Utilities. Uh, the, uh, why, why are the utilities always here? Uh, you know, our utility was founded in 1889 uh, and uh, in Spokane and uh, Pacific Power uh, shortly after that. You know, whether there have been depressions or world wars, there's any one industry sector that's been somewhat consistent. Uh, well, we're, we're an infrastructure to meet public need. And, and so what's interesting is in inside Spokane or even Southern Oregon, I can, I can look at economic cycles inside my utility going back 125 years now and, and who, who were the, the champions in our communities uh, going back 100 years that pushed you know, quality of life, livability, economic expansion, you know, people getting jobs. And uh, you know, sometimes we talk a little bit about, well, it really doesn't matter who does it as long as the job gets done and it gets done right. And uh, that that it's effective. So, you know, in 50 years and 20 years, nobody's going to remember that I was here. Uh, but they're going to wonder if uh, if we did the job right. And, and I guess in in perspective of who who are those champions? I uh, I travel to Spokane an awful lot, and so I get to see what we're doing up there. And I interface with five economic development agencies in Oregon just from a utility um, from our service territory. And then on top of that, I was the Oregon Economic Development Association uh, president of the board for, for a year. Uh, it, it really needs to be, I think, um, good collaboration uh, inside the agency. And so to that point, Bob Potter, uh, is uh, I consider him a friend of mine. I uh, haven't The same Bob Potter that... Yeah, that uh, okay. right. So, so, so Bob Potter uh, moved to Hayden Lake, Idaho, uh, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago, and became uh, an employee or a contract employee of the SoReady counterpart. And that's the way to which he began his recruitment efforts. Uh, about probably 15 years into that, uh, his contract fee was split with Avista and that continuing agency. So he was inside that agency, but then half his salary was being paid by my department and he was being staffed by my secretary in, in my department. So I understand uh, his, uh, his methodology of recruitment really well, and, and it has to be inside uh, the agency that he was a participant of in uh, Coeur d'Alene and in Spokane. Uh, I, I, I can also reflect a little bit because of how you know, my visits with him over the years, and you know, unfortunately Bob's dealing with end-of-life issues now. Uh, I haven't seen him in three or four years, but he's probably got to be late 80s or 90s. His, his uh, uh, strategies and his mechanisms of recruitment, uh, I don't think you can reverse engineer it in 2014. It worked in the 80s and 90s. I don't think it works in 2014. Here's a guy that doesn't even have an email address and he doesn't use a computer, but he was successful. He was successful in the 80s and 90s, not in 2014. And so I think that there are some strategies that economic development agencies across the country are trying to adjust themselves to. And, and all due respect to Bob Potter, and I tell him this if I were sitting at the Hayden Lake Country Club having lunch with him, he'd probably acknowledge it that uh, He's, his method is about 10, 15 years old at this point, and it's changed. And he and I talked about how that was changing. Uh, and so that's, that's my perspective on what, uh, what we're seeing in, uh, in the four states we're now operating, including Alaska. We just haven't gotten called by Juno yet. <laughs> <laughs> you got the facial hair for it. You're going to let it grow. You'll be able to stay warm. <laughs> so I have one other question, and I'm going to turn it over to my fellow uh, commissioners to ask. Uh, quite honestly, we hear 
and this is not new, Monty, you touched on it, right. uh, pre preamble, uh, about uh, a complaint against Soul Ready not being active enough. And I know the gentleman you're talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I've had, uh, you know, as a past Soul Ready president, I want to set that as I just need, everybody knows that, but I'm, I'm, I'm completely open minded on this, on what's best. But uh, I went through some of that same fire. From again, from you two that working so so we're taking Ron kind of off the table here for a moment. But you two have been working in this. Uh, you you test a little bit, but I'd like to have you. Can you put some meat on that, those bones as far as the recruitment? I know uh, because that's what we hear. Mm -hmm. That's what I hear, and I, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that my fellow commissioners have heard the same thing, right. not more than one time at least. Yeah. Is that uh, so? Ready's not getting the job done yeah. because they're not. They have who are they recruiting? Who are they doing this and that? And and like I said earlier to to Mark is that uh, you know we have X amount of money. We haven't decided what again what that X right. amount is, but it's going to be substantial, I think. Um, I don't, uh, so you understand what I'm saying? I, I, yeah, I understand. You know, I, I, know know you're, I know where you're going. I know where you've been. Uh, uh, I sit on five economic development boards in two states. Every one of those boards is criticized by members of the community for not doing enough, because you can never do enough. Uh, you just you just keep beating on the rock, and hopefully you have the right strategy and you make the right contact at the right time to make everything come together. Um, Again, I, I think a big part of the recruitment piece is, is that you have to be very targeted. You can't have a shotgun approach because nobody has enough resources to just go out and start pounding the pavement somewhere and be successful. You can't expect that. You, you don't have that kind of resource to give us. Uh, we don't have the resources available to do that. So what you have to do is you have to employ the experts in the field, the people that are the site finders, the people that actually go out and locate and work with these groups or these businesses to actually help identify where's the best fit. Because that's what they do. That's their profession. That's what we've done over the last several years. We've brought them into the area. What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? How do we go about? How do we target this thing? Knowing we have limited resources. That's what this proposal is about. This proposal is about trying to target specifically who do we go after, who do we foster locally to build those entrepreneurs, to build businesses and grow jobs, to grow the pie. We're always going to be criticized. It doesn't, you know, we could bring in a couple of Amy's, you know, and that's what you're, you're going to hear this also. We've heard this from the site finders. You're not going to bring in 500 uh, very often. You're going to bring in an industry that's going to bring 500 jobs. You're going to bring in 25 or 50, or you're going to foster something locally that will grow into that, basically. We had a home run with Amy's. You do that very rarely, especially in a bad economy because nobody trusts what the market looks like and whether or not they're going to get a return on their investment. We've turned the corner now. And you're starting to see evidence of that with the contacts from Business Oregon and what we've been able to foster. The timing of this is good because we believe that there is an opportunity now that didn't exist a few years ago. And that's why the timing is here now. That's why we're before you now. Okay. Gentlemen? Uh, I have a technical question to ask. First, what are we, you, you'd probably know this, uh, what level do we fund so ready now? 26,000. 26,000 per year. And the ask in this proposal, I didn't bring an additional today. 175. Okay, I, just, I had that right. Okay. Can, we, can you break that out again? Um, sure. What the ask is in the dollar. Yeah. yeah it, here, uh, in fact, I got something for you right here. It's in their proposal from last. Yeah, I just wanted. To. Oh well, it's, it's Commissioner, I, have, I, have one. I, I, I listed five separate items. I I could collapse those into two for you quickly. Uh, one of one of them is the funding that would that would put in place a full time business recruitment manager. Uh, uh, we have that pegged at eighty thousand uh, dollars. Additionally, we asked for uh, funding cash funding that would support the Southern Oregon Edge marketing campaign. This is the campaign that we've developed as as Monty said, based on the input and the and the guidance we got from the site consultants to uh, promote the businesses that make this economy strong. Uh, we want to continue to support the site consultant tour. Currently, the county is not a participant in that. Those annual events, that's $25,000. And then the last one that fits into that business recruitment is the virtual buildings concept. Um, when you read what the consultants say about this area when they get here, they comment over and over again. Um, uh, Mark alluded to the limitations we have on land use planning, one of the downfalls of Ernie's. But we have no physical buildings uh, that meet their criteria. Virtual building is a step short of putting 
five or six million dollars into a building and then waiting for a prospect to come along. Um, you can convert it to a real building at any point in time, but the idea is to have a couple of buildings, and I'm just in conversations with Colleen Johnston, who handles a lot of our business recruitment. We should, we've chosen to, to a virtual building at the 50,000 square feet and 100,000 square feet, uh, and that this would be I, I described this as, maybe I did this before, it's a little bit like the box of cereal, you know, or the cake mix rather. It's got everything in it to build the building. All you have to do is add the water. In this case, a business would just have to add their approval and add their money. Um, and that would address the, the lack of inventory. Because right now, we get shortlisted, dropped off the list a lot of times because we simply don't have anything to come and look at other than blank dirt. The last component, the fifth item, Commissioner, is the, uh, the, the startup business launch manager. And it, that's what that's we've reached the point with that effort um, here that the possibilities and the opportunities are such we need more capacity to, to support and engage more entrepreneurs to create the next generation of uh, te uh, trading sector businesses. So that all totals the one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Are you looking for this annually or one time? It, it, well, I would say this to you: you, you would want to invest in this on a continuing basis because none of, none of the goals that, you, that I think you would want achieved can be achieved in a 12-month window of time. You can do, we can launch the, the effort, but I think it must be something that's sustained. And all the other organizations that are trying to do what we are attempting to do with this would, would, would be saying the same thing. It must be sustained. So um, if, you, if you were to grant us the 70, 175000 I'll probably be right back here uh, before you uh, and budget time for the year 2015-2016, seeking a continuation of that. And uh, would you be seeking the full 175 again next year, and the following year, and the following year? I mean, how far no, yeah, um, um, looking at a 36-month uh, re recruitment process, 60-month yeah. recruitment return. What are we looking at here? Well, I think. The, 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 the two answers to your question. One, the, the virtual buildings piece of it, we think we can make that a revolving fund so that as a building gets taken up as a and constructed, that we that would have a provision that would refund our virtual buildings effort. So that, that 25000 wouldn't repeat on, on a subsequent annual basis. The business recruitment manager, yes, that in order for us to be effective, we need the ability to, to be aggressive over a period of time. And uh, you know, Mark made a pitch of three years. I think three years is, a, is surely a minimum. Um, even on a prospect that contacts us today uh, through whatever source, the window, the timeline for a decision on those projects <coughs> is easily 18 to 24 to 36 months. So in order for us to fill the pipeline with real results, the effort has to be sustained for a period of time. So we're looking at 150 requests. About 150 in addition to your existing 20, 26,000, um, and, I, and I'm, I fully understand and recognize that this board cannot, or any future board cannot obligate this, but... Um, you know, the unfortunate thing is, is that, uh, following up on that point, is that the, the, the board did come up and, and increase uh, their funding uh, three years ago, I think, or something was uh, like right. 100,000 or right. 80,000, whatever it was. And, and you was, were able uh, to put, uh, that was a rogue nexus, I mean. Yeah, rogue might, nexus, we. And that, that, was, that was a growing thing and heard a lot of good things. I went to a few of those meetings out there and those e-commerce people were, you know, talking languages. I had no idea what they were saying, <laughs> but but that was, that was really traveling. And then, of course, when that funding went away, that collapsed. Yeah. And I would also say that in that period of time, the focus that I believe we were, we were executing properly was what Monty had mentioned earlier. That was during a period of time when uh, our existing businesses were struggling to recover from the impacts of the recession, um, and that your support and your commitment was important in helping those companies that were at a point to grow and expand make those expansions. So it was a proper investment for the time period. Great. I just have a few more. If I were to give you a hundred thousand dollars and that's all I have to spend, where would you prioritize this list? Where would you spend the money? Um, well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an answer and then I'm gonna look to two of my board members so to get some feedback because that's the way the organization operates. But I guess if get posed that position, um, I would I would invest that in the. Uh, business recruitment manager and and try to still 
get the virtual buildings off the ground because if I if we have to go back to raising more money for the to continue and, and expand the marketing campaign the edge campaign we've done that we've, we've raised about forty five thousand uh, dollars last year we'll raise another forty or forty five thousand from our existing members we can sustain that if not we won't ever get to the level that I believe we need to get to and then the entrepreneurial piece I, I guess I'll have to go back to our you know other members and see if we can't find a way to, to continue that effort so you know, hundred thousand. I would probably, I, I would answer the response. I think it's the right time to invest in a more aggressive business recruitment. In order for us to be successful here, we need to create some interested prospects who, who find Southern Oregon to be an advantageous location. Um, right now, we depend largely on prospective business contacts, as I said before, that come to the state of Oregon, and we're given the opportunity to respond to those. But they didn't. Those are not prospects that have Southern Oregon as a target area. So we're trying to convert them from a Portland metropolitan prospect to a Southern Oregon prospect, and that has some limitations. Did I understand you correctly that you would uh, spend the money for the business recruitment and then you go for the virtual? So you believe that the virtual will be more important than the start the local business startup? Well, can I just answer that? I, I think that the entrepreneurial piece. Um, while it's really challenging right now, there are so many actors in our region participating in some type of entrepreneurial development. Um, part of the need is to create collaboration among all those various entities and uh, people who, who are involved in it. You know, the Angel Network is only a piece, so Rudy's got a piece. Uh, there are all these different pieces, and, and I think in the proposal, it, it's a way to bring that together. But if uh, absent the funding, uh, we, we might be able to get there on a sort of volunteer basis. Uh, I think you know there are yet people to sit down together at a table uh, to to figure out what each other's doing and how to how to move that on. Um, I think the the one challenging thing, not only for the Angel Network for Rogue Community College is that a lot of our entrepreneurs are, are not well developed into you know, being able to launch a business. And so there's something even earlier than simply facilitating access to capital that, that uh, is broken here in the region, mm -hmm. and it's not working. Uh, so I have a lot of conversations with a lot of people just because of my role on the access to capital side. Yeah, you know, that's that's what I. If I were a board member recommending the funding, I'd say, but we'll work on that piece uh, by bringing the right parties together. Oh, one of the things that I, um, I'm not in favor of this. Me speaking individually, at uh, nickel dime the situation. I'm looking for something that really makes an impact. That, that's going to make a difference. Whether it be Mark's proposal or your proposal, it's really going to make a difference. I don't, I'm not looking to say, for me, well, here's a little bit of money, do the best you can with it. Uh, because that's all. I mean, if we were in a situation where we'd absolutely, I recognize that again, we're dealing with public monies, but I'd like to see something come out of that, uh, whatever that that is. And so I, you know, I'm not to the point of asking how what well you would do with a lesser amount of money. <clears throat> I'm wondering, have you considered? Well, let's just say, let's just uh, theorize, man. So, so let's say that say the county says, okay, we're going to give you the the money, the, the con it all, the two hundred one thousand, which is that includes the twenty six you get now. Recognizing that you know that's a million dollars over over five years. Um, but recognizing something, you ever thought about using that as a challenge grant? I know that, that you've, you've worked hard on, uh, and Bill Thorndike, I know, kind of spearheaded your membership, right. increasing membership drive, and also increasing your, your uh, whatever, how you're in classify you don't have your levels. levels you know it used to be a thousand now I think you've got some with 2500 and such where, where, where have you thought about well gee was the county would fund us this uh, for a period but the challenge is okay business community you're the ones that's going to uh, to benefit by this so uh, well, commissioner the, the answer to your question is uh, uh, the hundred and seventy five thousand in addition to your existing twenty six thousand uh, is not all that I think it, we need to achieve regionally what uh, needs to happen. 
I think I've had this discussion with you, but um, when you, and Mark's numbers have alluded to this, when you look at what is what is provided by community, the major communities in Josephine County and Jackson County, I think we need to get the Jackson County piece of it in a proper level, and then we'll go back to the Josephine County piece. So yes, I think we can use a, a greater commitment from you to lever, lever, leverage additional commitments of dollars from other publics and from our private sector, where your money I hesitate to tell you if you give us 175, we can go out and raise another 175,000. But we can raise, we we will raise more money from memberships and from other public partners to support just exactly what is pledged in this effort. Well, I bring that up only because I think everyone was going to. The, that, that, I want to be clear. That is the discussion we had in discussing this internally with the executive board of Serenities that that. Well, I'm, again, I'm just floating the idea because it, say we all belong to enough boards, and that's a, that's a, 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 a mainstay anymore in, in, in board fundraising. As you get challenged, you get a grant from someone. Okay, it's a challenge grant or whatever that number is. And if you can get this, you get this. If you don't get that, you don't. You don't understand my point. So, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm looking for a greater participation from our private sector. Quite honestly. And, and it's a shame that we don't have more uh, uh, than we do now. So that's what, that's the reason I bring that up as some sort of a do is here's here's public money coming forward. Uh, and and you as know. you know, because uh, we did uh, work with our private sector members this last year, and generally they have all increased their support by 25 to. That's good. Good start over what they had been previously. Um, and we are constantly working on a membership. Membership for us takes two steps: so membership retention, <clears throat> retaining the members we have, but also uh, convincing those members to step up a level in support, and at the same time, uh, goals to add new members. Uh, w there's a lot of businesses that we think have reason to, to be supporters and investors in so many. So that's that's where the incremental additional funding will come from is through that continued effort. Okay, go ahead. I uh, have a few more. Um, I look at this and I put, you, is there an expectation that the county is going to bear the burden of this alone? Have you talked to the city of Medford, city of Central Point? Is there any way of looking at diversifying the costs here? Or is this just an expectation that we're going to be doing this over the next five years as an individual? Um, well, we, in the most recent recent year, we have received a significant increase in funding membership funding support from the city of Medford, uh, from uh, Ashland, uh, from Central Point, and then also from a number of our smaller communities, Eagle Point. As an example, I, 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 I can probably I can get you a list of all those increases. So we've done that um, to this level. Uh, no, well, not not to, not not to that level, um, but they've all increased their. Uh, 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 Ashland uh, essentially doubled their or nearly doubled their support from twenty seven thousand twenty seven hundred a year to five thousand a year. Uh, so they're not even close to what we're contributing to the 26. No, no. We and but I would say uh, I've had several conversations with some of the uh, administrative leadership of the city of Bedford to see an increase in their support. What, where, where have they been and what are they doubling? To? <laughs> How about if I tell you where they were, or where they are this year, and then tell you the conversation goes on. They, Previously, Medford, Medford was uh, an annual support at 26750 which is the same amount that Grants Pass provides. They've increased that this year to $33,000. And, and as I said, um, we are having continuing discussions with them. They, are, they budget on a biennial budget basis, so their next biennial budget starts, they start their discussions next year. So those increases that I'm hearing you say are basically used for your so ready operational needs. They aren't necessarily to put in place this business recruitment manager. So, and that's where my question lies. This business recruitment manager yeah. program that you want to put together, is it right. the intent of so ready for the yeah. county to bear the sole burden of that expense? Right. Well, Commissioner, uh, when we, uh, with the uh, strategic decision to reach out to our private and public sector members to raise our, ask them to increase their membership, 
we committed to them that we would spend 70% of that increase on our business recruitment edge campaign efforts. So that's so of our uh, annual membership increase, we pledged to spend 70% of that on the business recruitment effort, and the 30% will will be used for administrative operations and organization. And in addition to that, you, you've raised uh, uh, specific contributions yes. outside of outside membership. Outside of that. So yeah. we, we all wrote checks that were, uh, you know, um, basically doubled our membership uh, fees. So not only did we increase our membership, right. but we matched that. So just Avista, for instance, went from 2000 to 2500 in membership but then wrote another $2,500 check for the EDGE campaign, which fits into business recruitment. Right. So that's the edge. item number two, the Oregon EDGE market campaign. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. But right. still, the, the business the manager recruitment position is still would be the county paying for it, as if I understand that correctly. Right. We're, the EDGE campaign right now is being managed in-house with existing resources that are there right. Right. And, and putting it in place. Correct. Yeah. But it's on a shoestring. Yeah, it's on a shoestring. That's right. What's the highest amount that any private business provides you in terms of your operating budget on an annual basis? Uh, with membership and not addition about percentages that you double or whatever, but what's what's the hard dollar amount for the private sector? You can include, include utility, mm -hmm. that's fine, but that you receive from the private side. Well, I would, I would say on an annual basis we give someone in the neighborhood of ten to twelve thousand uh, dollars towards already activities. And you think that's probably the highest? Uh, is there anybody higher than the yeah, utilities? Yeah, we're 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 about there. Mm -hmm. We're about so the and, uh, utilities and the, the major banks are the. Mm -hmm. We're at the top, Danny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well this is really easy to figure out. Your annual budget is what? Operating budget. Oh, I'm sure. But we're annual, the total, the tar total bu a budget, a total total budget is about five hundred thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars. But that includes the funding we receive from the loan camp loan. Is that? I guess I'm. That, yeah, that no, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about what you're getting from EDA or yeah. anything. I'm not talking about that because what we get as we know that the four major mm -hmm. grants pass Medford, Jeff, Josephine County, well, well, Jackson, just, County just we give a little about one hundred and ten thousand dollars. Those four, those four entities mm -hmm. total, yeah. mm -hmm. and about a hundred, about a, about the, an equal amount from the private business. That's, I think that's not, what we're looking for. Not counting the other contributions. If you add those uh, back I in. Count uh, well, you can count those, and that probably pushes that total up closer to one hundred and thirty or one hundred thirty-five thousand right. dollars. Right. With their, we have memberships and sponsorships. That that's just the, the way we track our income. So, when Danny asked that question for one of our private sector supporters, there would be a membership and likely one or more uh, efforts that they support. Would it be the Edge campaign or the uh, site consultant tour. Some of them sp help us sponsor the costs of our annual business conference, which helps underwrite the cost of those events. Yeah. That's another headache that drives me crazy. <laughs> I apologize sure if I'm coming off. No, 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 if we do nothing, we know we're going to get the same, but we have to at least try something. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't know what those results are going to be, and and I think that's what you said, is we don't know what the results of this are going to be, uh, but if we don't do anything, it's going to die. So, and I think that's exactly what I heard from the previous presentation, we have to at least try to do something. So, with that being said, I see a million dollars being executed by potentially being uh, allocated and executed over the county over the next five years mm -hmm. into this program. What tangibles at the end of that five years are we going to see that we can say, taxpayers, we have this to show for it? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big number to be able to justify to the taxpayers if nothing. <laughs> so help me out with a tangible at the backside of this thing that we can we can tell the taxpayers how we are successful. Or there's a building or something standing there that we can sell that's at the back side of this that, that justifies the program. Right. Well, I think, and Mark gave you a pretty good picture of, of the sales cycle process in his presentation, and my mine would be pretty much the same thing. It's all predicated on touches with prospective businesses. I think the difference is that we intend to use the uh, 
Southern Oregon Edge marketing campaign, and it's it, 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 the camp. I mean, I wish I had time to actually go through it with because I could give you more, more detail. But um, the goal, the, the 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 structure of that is to generate contacts and connections with business people and business <coughs> owners, and to work those contacts as the targeted visits that we make to businesses. So our goal is similar to what Mark has said. We we will be making visits to those to those businesses. Uh, based on their interests and, and indicate, you know, they've they've gone to our website, they've checked the box, or whatever the case may be. And out of those, we think we, we can we can convert about uh, twenty to twenty five percent of those to location decisions. I mean, it means they've chosen a spot in Jackson County, and they're making their making investments, and they're on a pathway to create great jobs. Um, we'll also that will with. We'll also be utilizing and working in conjunction with our good friends at Business Oregon because, again, we get to leverage their efforts and activities. And there are, as Steve mentioned, Steve mentioned the Oregon Economic Development Association. We do have a collaborative partnership here in Oregon where economic development groups sort of pool their resources and, and attend trade shows specifically. These are events where you have a congregation of a concentration of certain types of business, targeted industries, you might say. So we'll continue that effort. So we, so we do those numbers. Uh, you're you're going you're gonna to see a, a, a thirty-five to fifty thousand dollar average salary from each of those jobs created, um, and, and you'll see a multiplier and an, and a property tax investment associated with them because. And I would take the, I take those numbers from what happens right now when a business comes to the region, makes an investment, creates jobs. We just we, we just model those examples as what we project from from these outreach efforts. <clears throat> Gentlemen, have anything else to add? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, as we look at this business recruitment manager position, you're you're allocating eighty thousand dollars for that. And I see salary benefits, travel, miscellaneous expenses. You're including everything into that eighty thousand mark. Um, <clears throat> it's been a few years since I've been in the private sector, but even in the private sector, eighty thousand dollars with travel, salaries, and and uh, miscellaneous expenses is not that much money to re recruit and retrain, uh, retain anybody that has half a brain. Mm -hmm. So let, help me out here. If we're not sharing the cost with this with anybody else, and we're spending eighty thousand dollars for a mediocre person to go out there and represent us, because we're not going to recruit somebody for that forty thousand or, or dollars annually, because the rest of it's going to have to go for plane fare and meals and benefits and everything else. Help me out. What are we going to get quality here? I mean, I don't see a realistic number here, and I'm having a hard time making that that nexus to where this is actually going to work well I, I was uh, uh, I I used my best judgment in starting with a salary that I thought we could attract uh, a, a, for that for that but I'll be honest with you I've always, I've always anticipated that we would raise additional money from other sources that would s supplement that so um, my ask to you was con is contingent on additional funding that we would that we will capture and leverage from other sources. Ones I've already included from our existing private sector members and from our particular our, our major other local jurisdictions, cities and counties. Do you have any uh, plan established or, or captured at this point in time of where that's going to come from? Who you're going to talk to? Or is there anything already written down saying that this is where we're going? This is what we're going to do? Or is that just something uh, I intend to get this done in the next few years? Uh, Let me help. Go, go ahead. I, I mean, I, 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 back, back in 2001, when I first got over here, uh, we had the, we had a real push by the business community, community leaders that wanted to do exactly what we're proposing mm -hmm. right here. And when I became president of the organization, we formed a group uh, together with a lot of the principals that have been active in economic development for a lot of years. We raised sixty thousand dollars, I think, over a couple of year period of time to help actually introduce what now the marketing group does right. that you right. change the name of again. So, there, we can raise some additional funds from private sources if we have a specific plan in place of how we're going to go about with recruitment, and if we have 
a funding source is going to help us take this thing off anyway. This is a relatively modest ask. Yeah. I mean, we didn't come in shooting the moon here for this thing here because, quite frankly, we want to have something that feels realistic that you'd be willing to consider and fund. And I think we can build off of that. And, and in fact, I think we can go to those same people that helped us before, and I think they'll help us again because they're the same people that are pushing for recruitment again that were doing it a decade or more ago. See, that was my point earlier when I said about whether I use the case of challenging, but uh, yeah, I think right. if we can just get the momentum, the inertia, I think, and moving, I think that I think that's very true. I was just a little more direct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, that's right. Um, did you have any, John? You've been pretty quiet over there. Well, I have. I've been thinking. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. That's a difference between you and I. But I talk and you think. Um, could I talk for a little bit? Yes, sure. <laughs> Do you mean I have to think? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in, in analyzing this, and, and if, if this was my decision totally, which it's not, it's the three of us, but the way I would handle this, and, and I have 35 years dealing with marketing firms, and so ready is a marketing firm, and so is Mark, uh, this is marketing. Something I realized in dealing with marketing firms, I've dealt with J. Walter Thompson on down, that after about five years, we always change marketing firms. And it's not because they got complacent or stagnant, it's more that they ran out of ideas, they needed fresh face in there. So with that in mind, my proposal, the way I would handle this, is I would fund Mark, and, and let me back up a little bit. We, we have a number of options, which we all know, but but we can we can fund one organization, we can fund the other organization, we can fund both organizations, we can fund nothing. You know, this isn't money we have set aside, we're gonna have to go to the well to get this money. So, so this is a given that we do this. What I would propose is uh, I would like to fund Mark the 100000 that he's asking for because I've been impressed for years with his enthusiasm, his entrepreneurship. Uh, with that in mind, I, I, uh, I don't see the value of having so ready have a, have a person in parallel with that. You know, although I would really like to see Mark and So Ready work in conjunction with each other, I, I think that you know, I you know, they have a lot of values they can bring to each other. Um, so if I take the business recruitment manager position off of So Ready, uh, what I really think So Ready, uh, what I'd like to see them concentrate on is the virtual buildings, because that's something that Mark's really not working on. So. So if the decision was up to me, I would fund Mark for the hundred. I would fund So Ready for the twenty-five thousand. Okay. I won't agree with you, but I'll let my my uh, associate over here comment. Um, what do you want me to do first? <laughs> comment on what John just said. Or? Let's hear your thoughts, John. Put his out on the table. I have serious concern on the ask. If we're getting into the deliberation side, we're done asking questions. Is what I'm at. I'm yeah. moving into. Yeah. I guess. I have serious concern over the eighty thousand in the recruitment manager concept. I think it's a low ask. I don't think it's uh, um, completely conceived all the way. I, 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 I know the concept is there. I know what needs to happen is there. But I, I'm not getting the feeling from so ready that. The details have been vetted out to the point where it, it, it can be put out to uh, to bid tomorrow or recruited tomorrow, um, and that has me concerned. I'll be honest with you. Um, it is a very large number, but I think that business recruitment manager is imperative that it, it, it gets into place. Um, I, I do agree with some of the uh, stuff I heard earlier, and in the previous pre presentation, there's a lot of a lot of companies that want to get out of where they're at, this is a great place to, to locate them. Um, one of the, uh, over the last several weeks, since you gave your presentation, I've been going out and meeting with the business community quietly in the office. And it's, it's amazing how people are, are critical of So Ready privately, even those that are very public supportive of it and what they have to say. So um, there's something in the mix, something in the air where that needs to be corrected with so ready and I don't know I couldn't put my finger exactly on it at the moment but um, there's there's some kind of change that has to happen there because every single business person I've talked to has said similar comments behind closed doors but they just won't say it in public for whatever reason so um, I think the board needs to take a look at so ready as a whole and, and figure out what that is as we move forward 
Uh, that's just I'm just telling you from what I'm hearing. The uh, the and I think that's important to pass on because if it wasn't passed sure. on, nobody would know. Um, I think the county puts twenty six thousand dollars, which seems to be the principal partner. And I don't see anybody. Uh, am I wrong? No, I mean the other three. The other three uh, jurisdictions put in twenty six thousand, but as well. They, so they but they just bumped up to thirty three. Yeah, but I'm, yeah, but I'm, you said that yeah. out of the. So right now. Yeah. Okay. That's why. So, but I don't see anybody else at making the additional investments for consultant tours or the additional fifteen. So I see that twenty six thousand instead of being a match by the other jurisdictions. Of thirty-three or thirty-five thousand, as the county going to a uh, a forty-five thousand type situation. I, I'd have to do the numbers off the top of my head. So, um, but I see us still being with this ask being the principal partner and nobody else stepping up to the same level. Um, so that I, I I'd like to see some higher participation from other jurisdictions in it. Um, I'm not a fan of the, the virtual building concept. I think I kind of alluded to that earlier. I came from the construction world. I know what spec building is all about. I've met with several developers here in town in the last several weeks that would jump on that ability to be able to be a partner and have something in place that can be sold. And they're like going, that we've tried that virtual stuff. It doesn't work in the industry. So has anybody in the organization really met with the developing the developers out there and said, what have you tried, what works, what doesn't work, before we go and spend $25,000 on a program that is going to um, uh, may or may not work? Well, we, we've used it previously, Commissioner, uh, and, and we were successful. So what, we, what we're proposing is that, is that the fund, your funding would allow us to recreate that program as it was used previously, funded from a, a source that's no longer funding, no longer available. Um, but it's our intention to go, if you were to say yes to that, our first contact would be all of our the major design, uh, construction and design build firms in, in the Valley and say, would you like to participate? Um, uh, uh, and again, I would say, we're, we're it's on the list to, to uh, add additional capacity based on the feedback we have gotten consistently from these site consultants. So we could choose to not listen to what they say, but what they've said is, you lack inventory. The, when, when, you, when I come here, um, I get a nice drive-through, but show me show me the bricks and mortar. Well, that's just it. I, if I were to invest, I'd want to say, here's $25,000 for a grant, go build the building, and have something you can sell over and over and over again. And that's kind of where I was a little bit. Yeah, I just don't think we can get, I just, I don't, I, I, I don't think we can get to that. Well, our proposal to you is to have two virtual buildings in design, uh, uh, and the benefit of that is that it that it would pre have pre approvals, such that it would expedite the time from an acceptance of that concept to construction. Mm -hmm. I looked at my good friend Mark, and I've talked about this many times. So, I mean, that's what. His firm firms do, um, but it, for us, it becomes that important asset. I'm sorry, it's a little bit like the auto the auto dealership. You know, if you want me to come walk on your lot, you're gonna ha you're gonna have to convince me that you've got something on your lot that I'm gonna want to look at. And so, uh, getting a building in place is that takes a lot of capital. It's a put, puts anyone's capital at risk for a period of time. Um, this concept is it is not as good as having. Uh, Vacant, available, ready to occupy buildings, um, but I think it puts us closer to the what you know. I, I can show you the piece of property, and I can give you an artist rendering of the building as it would look in, on construction. So that's that we're taking a point in between nothing and something. So, is there any plan? Is there anything in this particular plan that'll show sustainability over time, where we can reduce funding but yet it still moves forward? At what point in time does this start paying for itself, or is there is this designed to be off the public dollar into perpetuity as long as we keep moving forward? I, I guess I would say it's already sustained itself for 28 years uh, at, at at fairly lim at limited resources. Um, the monetary membership increases that we had a year a year ago last year 
were the first that I'm aware of for at least 10 years. Oh, yeah. it, it, Monty or Steve may have been involved in the organization. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we, the organization, myself and the board, have taken that issue on of not just continuing at that level, but to move the, move the organization, move our ability to meet the expectations and the opportunities in the region for economic growth. To I'm going to break in here just for a minute. We're, we're just kind of going in circles here for a bit. But to speak to that, sustainability, 28 years. I've been in the construction business for 42 years. I know all the major players. Yes, there's, like I said, complaints, but there's not enough recruitment, etc. But, also been part of the economic development statewide. So ready is a model. I hear that mm -hmm. everywhere I go. If they just had some money, mm -hmm. I mean, I hear that from Business Oregon. Mm -hmm. I hear that from your your economic competitors out there, the district competitors, from Ben, from from uh, Multnomah, the metro area. I think it's pretty remarkable that you've lasted for 28 years <laughs> on a, a, a ridiculously low amount of money. So, and you have proven results. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be a cheerleader here because I believe in the organization. It has nothing to do with, with where I was before, but you have results. I, and, and Mark, I've known Mark, you know, for a while here now. He was a customer at one time when I was in the private section. I haven't, I, I haven't seen anything you can point to, Mark, that this is something that, that you've done. I know you, you work for a great employer right now and such, but I'm, so this is where I'm going to disagree with John. Is I think there's there's certainly uh, better dynamics in house if uh, if we were to put this eighty or a hundred thousand dollars into a recruitment person uh, through so ready then you have that you've got Colleen Johnson on one side you got Ron Fox you got you know this infrastructure working around working in collaboration with one as an organization so if I'm a business looking forward to moving into here I go to an organization and know that organization because of the proven record track record mm -hmm. going to give me results mm -hmm. so I, I'm not I said this earlier on I'm not for splitting the baby I'm looking for the best part of the, in my own opinion where the money's best spent uh, I appreciate Mark's and he certainly has plenty of enthusiasm so he's a great guy, all of that, but I'm just I'm going for the people that I think that if they had the money would give us well, now whether we want to nitpick over twenty five thousand here and eighty thousand there. I do appreciate that Sorority came to us and said we broke it out for you. They could have just said, Hey, we give us a couple hundred thousand dollars mm -hmm. and uh, we'll we'll spend it well. Mm -hmm. We get those kind of requests. Mm -hmm. uh, not to that extent, <laughs> well, but uh, nevertheless. So um, and I don't know how we're, what Again, what's this? The board has to make a decision, uh, a majority. But uh, I, I'm I'm for 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 make funding. So Reddy's request, as presented. I'm just trying to find out on the business recruitment manager and the uh, business launch manager because mm -hmm. we're talking about a hundred and thirty thousand mm dollars -hmm. annually, hundred and thirty-two thousand five hundred to be exact. Mm -hmm. In five years, how's that going to be paid for if we're not seeing any tangible return and we decide not to pay for it anymore? Can, can I answer that? I think it depends on what the economy looks like. I think it depends on what our opportunity is. If, uh, if the economy were to slip back into recession type of a mode again, there's not going to be opportunity for businesses to be recruited and moved here. We're not going to spend money on recruitment. Uh, again, we we go back to trying to help existing businesses and retain those jobs here locally, which is what we've done through the last recession. Again, if the economy is robust, yeah, we're going to want to accelerate those efforts. That's that's one of the reasons why, uh, Commissioner, it's really difficult to answer a lot of these questions because we're asking for an, an investment and you're asking for something very tangible out of it. At the end of the day, that's not economic development. I mean, it's like fishing. You cast. You reel in, maybe you get a bite, but you can't get it in. Every now and then you land a fish. That's economic development. It's an inexact science, and it's very political. I will tell you this, is that as a utility and being a major investor and giving a lot of our time to economic development activities, I've restructured three groups, been a part of restructuring three economic development groups in Northern California and Southern Oregon. They all look like so right now. And that's from hiring a national consultant to come in and look at what we do here locally and applying that in other areas. 
I'm not. Gonna, we have so few resources, we can't split resources to be effective. It's as simple as that. It really has to go towards an entity that can coordinate those resources with the state, with local stakeholders, public, private sector partners. If you can't do that, you're at a disadvantage with other, all the other regions, especially when Bend is our huge competitor for us. And it's really difficult to compete with them if we're going to splinter resources and send them to other areas. As, as, as a utility, I'm not going to invest in, in Mark's activities because he doesn't have the, the coordination and the conduits with the state that Soberty does. If you're going to do that, I think you're just going to splinter the activities and you're not going to be as effective as you could be. It's as simple as that. Mr. Chair, I would like to add that uh, when I talk about entrepreneurs, if we look back through history, you know, to uh, say the fellow with Bramo, I mean, this wasn't Honda that developed the uh, electric motorcycle, you know, there's always there's always an entrepreneur which reminds me of Mark, you know, the Bill Gateses are out there, you know, now, you, we see what happened with IBM, but I'm not being critical of So Ready, I'm just saying that, that sometimes we need new fresh ideas, and that's why I hope that they could work together. Well, I would absolutely agree with that. I would think, uh, as uh, Mark stated his reasons for wanting to go out and do this individually, I respect that. But as, as a past uh, so ready board chair, as you, I mean, I would I would love it if this was internal. I mean, that that that's, was my point, John. Is that, and, and I think speaking just of Monty's last statement, it's splintering off. It just, that just that just goes against my grain. Why would we do that? Uh, so. Um, yeah, I would, I, I would as well, but I still think I like having one entity giving our money to and then one entity to hold their, hold, you know, hold their feet to the fire, if you will, uh, accountability-wise. Uh, I think we send a, 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 a poor message to the, to the business community, and, and I, I firmly believe that if we could get Soretti funded correctly, I think the business section will, will come in behind and say, okay, and I, wow, this is quite a commitment. And I'll get aboard. I'll, because you hear about it. Well, what are you guys doing? And and we are talking about public money. And I already said earlier, I'm disappointed that the private sector doesn't do more. You know, uh, there at uh, at, at uh, Edco up there in Bend, you got to pay to sit on the board. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, that, that, but they have results, and I think that had happened here. But we're not going to do it on on. Three hundred thousand dollar budget. It is. It isn't going to happen. I'd like to know one thing. If we we're talking about a million dollars over five years, we have a lot of stuff that we're trying to do. A new DA's office. Uh, trying to get the fairgrounds squared away. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on with the county right now as a business itself. Danny, where do you see this million dollars over five years coming from? Where do we see pulling the money? I mean, how do you how do you see us funding this? Well, I mean, okay. Essentially, you guys have two hundred thousand dollars in contingency of what you've spent seventy-five thousand. You haven't passed that order, but you will. But you will for the uh, road community college. We did. No, it's on tomorrow's agenda. Uh, so you have one hundred twenty-five thousand in contingency. Um, the ask obviously is more than one hundred twenty-five thousand. I do just maybe want to remind you that individually, you obligated yourself with a huge sum of money. A million dollars uh, to an economic development project already. <clears throat> um, you know, essentially moving from this year budget year to next budget year, and in the current budget with the library <coughs> district having passed, we'll have a million dollar operating deficit this year. Next year, we'll see roll up costs of about 7.2 percent. That's 4 percent increase in our PERS rates. So uh, we'll see about a 4.5 percent increase in revenue, which means we'll have another million dollar shortfall. Just for current uh, service level. So you've obligated a million individually. We have a million dollar shortfall now. We'll add another million dollars to that, so we're three million, and you've spent 70, uh, 75 of your 200,000 contingency. That's based on our budget. It's not based on how we spend money. It's based on how we budget money. We typically underspend our budget in the general fund, which this would have to be funded from the general fund. Uh, somewhere between a million and two million dollars, but so we would still be looking at a couple million dollar operating deficit, no matter how, what, what you choose to fund um, or how you you know how you choose to fund it. 
If you choose to fund more than your contingency, we're going to be required to do a supplemental budget if we don't uh, understand our current budget. And the thing that is a little uh, compli complicates that to some extent is that two of the three of you won't be here to do a supplemental budget after the, the first of the year. So that's a, that's a problem because you could tell them yes and we could do it, but then the next board can say they don't want to approve what it is that in the supplemental budget process. If you use your contingency, you just pass a board order and it's done while everyone's here, which is 100 and, as I said, you have about $125,000 left in that. We have roughly a $43 million general fund balance, however, <coughs> about $8 million of that is for debt service on our building, about $10 million of that is for the operating operations of the county until we collect our tax base. So, you know, you're, you're down around twenty. Six twenty-eight million dollars uh, in fund balance as a non-operating cost. I don't think it's a big deal to our budget. I mean, honestly, if you were to agree to fund whatever you agree to fund, um, it's not going to hurt us operationally. If it's a non-operating expense, if we're going to agree to do this for consecutive years, it becomes an operating expense. And as I just explained, our operating budget is going to be two to three million dollars deficit before we make any cuts or adjustments moving into the next year. Really, well, I didn't let them. They, they wanted to talk while you were making your presentation. I wouldn't let them either. Okay. No. So, no, I appreciate that, Mark, but I, I didn't. They asked, and I said no. That wouldn't be correct at that time. So. I made my pitch. Okay. <laughs> Well, and I've made mine, so um, I'm chair, so I can't make a motion. Well, I'm uh, Don. Was your was your uh, proposal to fund? I proposed it. Funds request? already. Okay. Don, let me ask: Are you proposing to fund it at the level being requested, and go ahead and go through the supplemental budget process? Yes. That's the only way we can do it. And your proposal is—I think I can make a good argument. I don't know if I can or not, but somebody a lot smarter than I can. <laughs> and your proposal is to not fund Mark at all. Correct. Okay. Because I think it just splinters. I think it just sends the wrong message and splinters it up. But that's—I already shared that with you. Nothing personal in this. Can, can I ask one question about your your business outreach person? Mark has proposed a specific targeted um, service, you know, technology sector. Yours wasn't limited to that, was it? It wasn't. It was not limited to one singular sector. But it. But it. But it, it, you go into our target list. High tech is in, in our list. So. Sure. But uh, I guess my point is, you won't necessarily be both doing the same things if both things were funded. Correct. I mean, because you may be doing some of the high tech industry, but that's all he's going to be doing, and you're going to be doing other things as well. I mean, maybe there's a way to coordinate who's working on what uh, in terms of funding these uh, activities where you're not duplicating, but you're getting the most out of the money you're getting and out of the money he's getting if this proposal is accepted. Um, so I, I just want to you know, clarify that yeah. I didn't believe it to be the exact same thing. Well, what I was trying to avoid here is Mark talked about driving to California, I, I, you know, to San Francisco. I don't want to see Mark and uh, and a so ready employee following each other down the highway. I'm hoping that we could somehow work this out to where we would uh, only fill that position with one person. I would make a motion, but Doug, I haven't heard your feelings on this, so I don't want to make a motion. Well, you can I, make a motion for discussion. You know, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm. I support this already concepts. I support what you're trying to do. I see the big picture that you're trying to get there. And like the reason I was hard on my questions is because I need I need that to feel that commitment, that passion coming out of so ready that, that frankly I heard out of the, the previous previous presentation that that passion, that commitment. I, I'd like to somehow capture that that I just didn't feel there. I mean, it, it sounds odd. I know. But I support the so ready 
uh, program. Um, frankly, I'm in favor of, of more of putting it out for an RFP if we're going to be looking at a, uh, a business recruitment type person and saying how do, how do we get the best out there. I, I'm, I'm not convinced and I've heard it very clearly from everybody today. What we're doing over the past 20 years or, or whatever somehow hasn't worked and why, that's why we're in the position we're in today. So having somebody from our local community be that person going out there and advocating on their behalf or whatever may not be the right person. We may need somebody that has a fresh set of eyes that have never been here before to say this is, this is what reality is guys. I know you live here and this is what you like but sometimes you have to have that guy or person come in and say this is reality and this is what you should be doing. And so maybe putting it out for, uh, for that recruitment on a national basis or whatever might bring in that fresh talent that would actually get something done. And that's kind of where my, 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 my thought is right now. I said, if we're going to fund something, let's fund something to a level that we can get a, a really good person in here to recruit those businesses to bring them in. And then develop some kind of, which you already have, as a program that, that nurtures the existing and keeps them moving forward. But from what I'm hearing is that we're missing that key component of the recruitment process. That we have this great nurturing and, and program that we've been built over the recession that keeps everybody whole locally. Because that's, that's really important to keep our local businesses healthy in this process and not have them run out by somebody new. So how do we balance that and, and how do we really make this work and, and, and get that fresh perspective on our community? So that, that's where my head's at. Well, Commissioner, I, I, I'm... Uh I'm not sure how to respond to the passion part of it. I would say that um, if there's anything about Soretti and myself and the other individuals who really do the, the work of Soretti, passion is what we're all about in terms of getting things done. Uh, the second thing, I think we've, we've invested, we've raised dollars and invested in those uh, the efforts that we believe uh, put us at a most competitive advantage we can. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've, we're the, I, I think we're the only regional economic organization in the state of Oregon that's put, this, put some money into the site consultant visits and we've sustained it. We've, we've done, so we've sustained that for four years and we've raised that do those dollars from, from our uh, private members and from our, some of our public members. Um, um, the, the, having a person full time following, uh, agree, making outbound calls and following up on business businesses is exactly that piece that's missing from what our consultants have told us. So, uh, you know, I, I, I guess, uh, <coughs> frankly, uh, we've been trying for the last couple of days to get one of the recent consultants who visited here to follow up with you, the commissioners. So you, so you have some sense, maybe give you an outside perspective, as you said, getting some outside perspective on it. Um, these are people who, yeah, we paid their airfare to come here, but they gave up of their personal time to come and spend time with us. And so we've used what they have shared with us and they have built our proposal on that, on that format. So I think, um, I believe what we presented to you is, okay. is you know, good. But I've been another thing else. I'd like to add, though, too, the thing I like about funding an organization as opposed to an individual. I mean, I sit as a liaison on that board and participated as a board member in the past. You've got some pretty skookum business people, along with some private or public sector folks on that board that serve on the general board and on the executive board. So it's not Ron Fox up there just calling the, well, this is what I think is best. I mean, I can't think of anybody that I respect more as two business, I mean, people here than Steve and, and, and uh, what's his name down there? <laughs> I respect him, I just can't remember his name. How do you like that, Monty? Oh, uh, yeah, George. <laughs> anyway, and other members on that board, I'm serious. So, so there are some good discussions that go on during the general board meetings, but the heavy lifting's done, which I'm not part of, but on the executive board with, with good business folks that I think are making the right decisions and giving the right directions. They just haven't had the resources to go out and, and execute what they think needs to get done. That's my whole pitch. Is I think there's an opportunity to provide those resources for a kickoff. I know we can't do anything three, four years down the road, can't commit, but we would want to say hopefully some sort of sustainable funding. Again, that'll be up to each board. 
but this is our opportunity to a, to an organization that's well respected and has a board full of respected business people, men and women. I, I just think, and again, that's not anything, uh, Mark. I'm just saying that I'm looking at an organization that has the structure to get the, get the work done, uh, and all it takes. So, uh, can I ask a question here? Um, is is it going to hurt anything if this sits on the table for three weeks? Not 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 to not to us and not to me. I don't think. I mean, it, I the reason I the reason I ask, and I don't see a, a real impact in three weeks, but I see a supplemental budget coming up if we do this, and I'd like to know who the players are going to be in that supplemental budget decision, because oh. I'm let me let me finish my thought, because if they, if that happens and we have to get that done. I'd like to know what that's going to look like before a decision is on funding. Otherwise, I would say let's use a contingency fund right now and not uh, go into a supplemental budget. Uh, and that, But that has an impact on funding levels and, and the work that needs to get done. So that, that I'm kind of, you know, I, what I'm really fearful of is putting something in place and having it reversed and, and leaving somebody and high and dry. I'll come back and haunt the hell out of you. <laughs> Is that after death or before you die? <laughs> let, let, let me say a couple things about that. Though. First of all, a supplemental budget doesn't have to happen unless we're going to exceed our appropriation authority. So we're, we're not, it's not guaranteed that we have to do a supplemental budget if we underspend what we've budgeted in elsewhere in the general fund, okay. which we typically do. And I said to a million to two million dollars. So that's why I said I would see no problem if you provided one hundred and seventy-five thousand and whatever the other ask is, because we will understand our budget that much just based on history and mostly due to vacancies in general fund positions in the county that take three or four months to fill when someone leaves. Uh, the other thing is the decision makers in the supplemental budget process are legal, so you're. You know the board, so it may be this board, but it may be the next board if a supplemental budget were required. But it's not required unless we're going to hit appropriation authority. We wouldn't do a, a supplemental budget to add appropriation when we're not going to hit the appropriation that we already have, and we likely won't. That's why I explained it the way I did. <coughs> one to two, one to two million. Uh huh. I'm, I'm just trying to look at the big picture. Well, I'm saying in the current year. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not I speaking in other years, but. I know the fair board's coming up before us, before oh, the sure. month, and we have this, and I'm trying to look at the big picture on everything that's being stacked up. And, and you have the historical society, and you, you have all sorts of people asking for money. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's why I'm asking the question. <laughs> I, I guess, uh, Commissioner, if I could speak to uh, the, five, the three week question that was posed. I, um, I think we could, we so really could appropriately use that time to more fully flesh out the additional funding that we think comes as a result of your support, that which I think would help some questions that you have posed. But that would be really helpful. Okay. Okay. Well, You've had three weeks to get that almost a month. You've had their proposal for a month. It's not. It's not their proposal. It's a. Well, I think this will give them time to be able to potentially leverage this for additional funding with our community, and to be able to fund this position wholly. Is that is that what I'm hearing? I don't want to micromanage your budget. No. Are you, are you referring to raising a, a match in three weeks? Getting something on this business uh, recruitment person. I don't. I don't think we can. Yeah, that. Well, that was not what I was weeks. proposing. You know, I mean, uh, 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 no, I, I, that, no, that's not what I was. I was saying. Uh, Commissioner Rasher has something. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion, but I want to ask Council first. Could I make a motion that we fund a certain entity for a period of three years? Could that be part of my motion? Even realizing that. That may all change. You can make a motion that we enter into a contract. Right. Contract. You can't, you can't bind a future budget committee to appropriation. So you could say that you want to make a motion that we enter into a contract for a specific period of time. That's not a guaranteed revenue, as I explained, sure. because of. And we would always include the, the non appropriation cost, so a future board could um, choose to cancel that contract for non appropriation. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair. 
I would move that we uh, fund Mark Von Holly for a period of three years through a contract, and that we fund So Ready uh, to the amount of 123,000 for a period of three years. Also, so hold on just a second because that motion has all the financial implication in the first year because you can't spend money in the second and third year. If you would have just said to enter a contract, that's fine, but you said fund a three-year contract, sure. which means right. you are going to yeah. appropriate funds for the three-year contract and yeah. provide payment up front. Right. Can we write that down to where it's proper then? You know what, well, what, do, you what, want, I mean. what do you want? I want yeah. to make sure. Yeah, I want the three-year contract, but we're just going to fund it a year at a time. Does that make sense? Well, you can just say a three-year contract yeah. for each of those. Okay. And uh, the amount of that based on the annual year. amount they proposed. Um, or that you proposed. Yeah, right yeah, and just for clarification, because Mark um, indicated his ask was between 90 mm -hmm. and 100. Right. So is there a specific amount or? Yes, and I, I did say uh, uh, for Mark for 100,000 and for So Ready for 123. And where I got to 123 is I subtracted the 52 out of there for the, uh, the startup fees there. So, uh, tell me again how I can uh, how I can phrase that properly. Uh, well, we should probably do two two motions, two separate ones. Not one to enter into a contract with So Ready um, for the appropriate amount, and then a second uh, action item to do a contract with Mark um, for the appropriate amount. Hmm. But I don't want one without the other. Then you can have one motion with both. Yeah, one motion with both. It would just be cleaner to do two separate ones. But okay, all right. <coughs> All right, let's try it again. I would move that uh, that we sign, tell me if I get this right, that, that we agree to a three-year contract with both Mark Von Holly and So Ready. Uh, Mark Von Holly's being $100,000 per year, or first year? Per year? Per year. Per year. And So Ready's being $123,000 per year. Hey. Okay. You said that to tell you. Let, let me just yeah, say this. Okay, what you may want to do is authorize the county administrator to execute a contractual agreement with each oh, of those two okay. parties rather than you want to sign a contract. With sure. Them. All right. Uh, just because that gives me the authority to negotiate on your behalf the terms of the contract before you actually gets brought back to you for you to sign it. Unless you know what the terms you want no. in your contract no, besides the amounts. Okay. So, you, you know, you can authorize me to negotiate a contractual agreement with them up to three years at their annual amount and then bring it back to the board for final approval, which we have to do. So, so moved. <laughs> <laughs> they have that down one now? No, it's recorded. No. <laughs> <laughs> you understand it, Joel? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Do we have a second uh, motion? We'll second for plenty of discussion. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Uh, now a discussion on the motion. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to vote no. Okay. Uh, beforehand, for the same reasons that uh, I've already reiterated several times, it sends the wrong message. We're out trying to raise money. Uh, it's already out trying to raise money. Well, who's doing the who, who, economic? You're supposed to be the economic development people, but you, uh, I just think it makes it. And I'm not sure about how it does out in the community out in California or wherever it is. Uh, so I, I'm for, for all those reasons, I'm opposed to that. I understand. You understand you, you basically what you want to do is see some competition. If well, I, I what I'm that. hoping is that Mark can fo fo focus on the. Uh, the high tech, the electronic sector, and that uh, so ready can pick up the slack on other areas. Very blunt. Okay. So, can I ask? Uh, I would like to ask a question. So, under the contract with with Mark, based on his on his uh, uh, guarantee that he can perform. That is that part of the contract? Well, it's something I've learned about marketing. There's no guarantees in marketing. Well, I mean, we've okay. all asked for guarantees, and there's just not okay. guarantees. I just want, just want, I just want to clarify. Yeah, so, so it's a, it's free. It's free deal. Here's a hundred thousand dollars. Go, go do your best. That's right. It's same as still ready. Okay, one with a proven record. Okay. Although I would suggest that the contract would identify the tasks that are going along yeah. for the payment, yeah. so that there would be some accountability along with. 
reports to you on the progress made with regard to expending those funds, quarterly reports, you know, semi-annual, monthly reports, whatever the specific task is. So I wouldn't say it would just be, I wouldn't recommend, you could just give $100,000 and say do whatever you want with it, but I would recommend that you tie it to what the proposal was with the specific detail of the proposal outlined in the agreement. And it could be as much as calling it Appendix A and attaching it to a personal services contract right from the proposal they made. It doesn't have to be too complicated. So you, Danny, you feel comfortable putting in the uh, performance type clauses into that so that there's some kind of something coming out of it? Well, deliverables. Deliverables. I don't think there's going to be guarantees, but they're, they're be reporting to you on specific I guess on the proposal. Now the other thing is, you know, it's it's your money. If you like the proposal or don't, you could say, well, we'll fund it, but we want you to do this, this, and this. You've done that before as a board. It was so ready when we hired, when we did the contract with them before. You specified specifically what activities you want done, and I did delineate those in the contract. And they did provide the reports, you know, that showed the progress they made towards those. So. If there's things you don't like about one of the other presentations, you don't have to just accept it and fund it. Or you can be as liberal as we're going to fund the whole thing and do a good job for us. So John sold a hundred thousand. He said between ninety and a hundred, so sixty for salary. Now he hasn't got his other commitments. So right. So what happens there? You know, I I thought about that, but I didn't come up with a solution on that. Do you have an idea on that? Yeah. Um, I, I have a solution. Yeah. It has to come back to the board for final approval, and we would not bring it to you for final approval until the other components have agreed to okay. participate. So we can we can draft a contract and have it all prepared to go, so that if Mark is successful in recruiting his other two or three and the other people he's working on, and we can have verification provided of that, then we can bring the contract. And you can your final order can make it contingent on those particular things when you authorize me to sign the contract. Okay, so what kind of a, of a verification can we give Mark so that he has that leverage when he goes and talks to his other partners that, that the county's committed? We'd have this motion as part of the right. We would have the motion. The motion well, I mean, and if you guys wanted, I could write, a, or you could write a letter. We could write a letter saying that the county is interested, but however, it's contingent on the other partners participating. Okay, and then when you say participating, is there some sort of guarantee that they would give that they were? He said that he was asking the same amount of three people. Yeah, but I mean, you know how often. You know, this happens a lot with the fair board where somebody says, oh, yeah, I've got to commit, and then they never do. You know, they back out. How do we somehow well, put some teeth into that? Well, I will say this also. Every contract we have has a 90-day termination clause according to your contract for your board rules. So if they don't okay. and the board decides they don't like it, they just give 90-day notice in both of these cases. Sure. We would have to still fund it for those 90 days, but, I mean, you're not stuck with a year of funding. Okay. And do we have a commitment that so ready has to perform that way? Do they have to give a, a, a you know, in order for the funding to be valid for them? Well, they didn't propose other right, partners. Right, right. That's a different. Okay. Right. Uh, I mean, I would say no. I would just say you would give them the funding based on the. Right. I'm relying on their yeah. expertise. Okay. Okay. I'm still going to go ahead. So we have a motion. Uh, any more um, questions? Yeah, I'm thinking right now. So sorry, I'm just chewing on the, the concept. So that funds them at 125, 50 shy of uh, their ask. 123 plus or 26, they already get. Oh, so that puts them at the 150 plus annually. I, I don't mean to be presumptive on why you made the recommendation you made, uh, John. However, if we're going to do anything over $125,000, cutting it back $50,000 in terms of administration of it is not valuable. It may be valuable in terms of your view of how the public wants their money spent. I'm not arguing that. Uh, so if we were going to stay within the $125,000 mark, it's a contingency. If we're going to go above that, it's a potential supplemental budget. So, you know, funding them at full. the full amount and him at the full amount procedurally doesn't create any more complication for us. It does buy our fund balance down by that difference, but it's, a, it's essentially treated as a non-operating expense because you're doing it a year at a time. Are you interested in modifying that a little bit? Uh, no, not unless I see some valid reasoning. 
me some. Not that your reasoning was invalid. <laughs> so, what? The, let me answer the valid reasoning why I made the comment. You said that you expected Mark to do the high tech stuff and so ready to pick up the slack. But the truth is, SoReady will also be doing high-tech stuff, not in competition with Mark, but in cooperation with Mark. Let's be honest, when Mark goes back to California and brings someone here, they're going to be looking at the enterprise zone, likely, or the mm -hmm. e-commerce zone, or anything that SoReady manages. Right. So they're going to have to work together, right. and they're going to have to be partners. And so I don't, I don't see you being able to differentiate that Mark's just going to do this and they're going to pick up everything else, because... Mark is just going to do that, and that's fine, but they're not going to just pick up everything else. They're going to pick up everything else and do that, because they have to. Right. Well, and I didn't mean pick up the slack. I mean, that they would focus on, who knows, the agricultural, the uh, food processing, the uh, things other than high tech. Well, but John, if you, if you don't mind, you know, if I crunch the numbers real quick. Can I finish while you're sorry. doing the numbers? Is that high tech? So we're going to be differentiating. We got you got electronic manufacturing. That so what? How would you how would you delineate the difference? I mean, that, to me, that's just telling. That's just saying. Well, here, okay, we're going to do this. Um, we're going to give you one boxing glove, uh, but make sure that you don't put on the other boxing glove because we already gave the other boxing glove to the other guy. That may be a terrible metaphor, and it is a terrible metaphor. But the point being is, is that I don't see I don't see that workable. It makes well, uh, as me, a good business guy like you, I can't see how that to, even makes sense. To me, what I see what Mark's trying to do is he's trying to get the higher wage jobs in. Where I have so a feeling, so, yeah, but so ready he's looking at the Amy's kitchens and things like that. <laughs> and uh, not that they're bad, you know. But uh, well, we went through the whole thing with Amy's kitchens, and I'm, you know, I, I don't think that's your target. Yeah. But you know, so but to say. <laughs> When, when, when they have a Colleen Johnson or somebody out there uh, talking about Southern Oregon, oh, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you uh, because that's that's uh, we have another contractor doing that. But I'll talk to you about. Do you want to grow beets? Uh, does that make? I, I just don't see Mark. I mean, I'm, I'm John, I don't see how that works. I, I think you're right that Mark may just be focusing on recruiting those people. But here's here's the biggest point. I think it falls right in line with what Don's saying. And I, and I said part of this before, but when Mark brings someone here, Mark can't do all of the functions that are going to be required to be done to get a business more interested in. So uh, talk Absolutely. about the enterprise zone, the e-commerce zone, business organ, uh, you know, all of those types of things. Are, and I'm not saying Mark has contacts, but that's facilitated through so ready. So it'd be great if Mark can bring someone, but not great if they can't do what they need to do to be able to get them here. <clears throat> okay, I'm sorry, Doug. I stepped on you. Go ahead. Oh no, it's fine. It's good discussion. I mean, this is this is probably the most robust, healthiest discussion we've had as a board of commissioners. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, then just agree with me and let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying the moment. Let me rub it. So I'm seeing a uh, an $825,000 proposal of what you're saying. And no, well, you know, Doug, I know you will be over time, but not yeah, for, sure. yeah, for yeah. over a three year period. Let me, let me. Okay. so 825,000 over three years. The so ready to ask is about 880 over 60 months, which is five years. Um, my biggest question is, is I sense some tension between Mark and Sorek. I sense that tension is there with the board, the staff, something's going on that's not necessarily being revealed completely. Uh, with that being said, if we send two people out into the into the world to go accomplish the same the goal same goal essentially, I like the competition idea. Frankly, I, I'm I think that competition is healthy. I'm a capitalist. Everybody that that's what builds a market. Um, go ahead. So competition to get stuff done is what sports is all about. You know, I can go on with those analogies. How? How do you think that the So Ready and Mark are going to be able to interact as necessary? Because I don't see Mark being successful unless he's able to work with So Ready and the current board to be able to get that retention coming in. 
so how do how do I see Soready and, and Mark how, actually integrating this? I'm, I'm having a hard time making that nexus because, frankly, if they sit there and they thumb each other across the desk, it's not going to do us any good and it's wasted money. Well, and I haven't seen. I agree, and I and that's why I made in my earlier statements they need to work together, and I believe they will. Well, you, know, you can require that. It's your contract. So if that's what you want the contract to specify, we just put it in there. But how, how do you do that, though? Okay, if, if, if we're expecting Mark to bring home four businesses uh, a year, I think that was the number, whatever that number was, okay, and, and again, it, and I, I, I trust Mark's integrity, so, and I, as I do so ready, so I can't see what a purpose like trying to screw the other person, or pardon my language, try to, to uh, whatever. Um, I, I don't see how that works, you know, builds that in a company. If you just talk about competition, it'd be one thing if there's one business, another business, but, but we're talking about bringing people to Southern Oregon, so I can see them stepping all over each other, and I think that sends a wrong message. Uh, uh, so I, I think you're, you're saying what I'm saying. If you're sending them out there, how do we... How's that coordination effort work? I'm not seeing that clear picture. Well, and I'm having a hard time make, seeing those that transmission when you're running. Here, here uh, you know, let me just say this. As I just said, you put it in your contract. But the truth is, you're the, you guys are the ultimate authority. If they're not doing it, to terminate the contracts. I mean, you have all of the leverage. It's your money. It's your con public money that you're managing. It's your contract. You just develop the terms. If you see them thumbing thumbing their nose at each other, one side or the other, you can say, fine, we're not going to work with either if you can't figure out how to work with each other. You have that authority. How would, how would, you, how well, would you really know that in the real world? Well, we can, and we can build it in, just to, 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 to piggyback on what Danny said, we can build it into the contract and insert contract language, calling that a four-cost termination. I mean, we can come up with some language. And, and, and this isn't a court of law. It doesn't need to be... Uh, uh, beyond, you know, preponderance of the evidence for you to decide to execute a contract, right to terminate a contract. We could, we can build in language that if, if the board in, in, who's in place feels that either party or both parties are not doing what they're supposed to be doing as part of the contract, then we can build it in that the, the board can terminate it. You don't have to have, uh, you know, the smoking gun evidence. Well, the truth is they'll both reporting, be reporting to us. They should. That's true. And I think that that's your way of knowing. I mean, you're going to know if they come in here, that if they're not working together and they're doing You're not going to know out in the marketplace, Danny. Well, you may not know in the marketplace, but you're going to know. That's where it's important. It's in the marketplace. Well, but you're going to know in your office whether or not it's happening in the marketplace. I agree that the marketplace may not know it, but you're going to know it. You know all sorts of things that aren't said here publicly because you have individual meetings with all of the people around the table that you're going to still know or anyone who's sitting in your seat's going to know. And then it's going to be your choice whether you want to continue or not. Although, I'm, I'm just giving you an option because you asked how. And, you know, you don't have to do it that way. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that you necessarily do. I'm just answering questions about how you might accomplish something. Do you have any more questions, Doug? Because we do have a motion and a second on the floor. No, I, I know. I'm just... <coughs> I'm, I'm just chewing for a moment. So if you guys need to talk, talk. I'm just well, you know, I look at Mark like a, a contractor, you know, and we have a lot of contractors at the county. I mean, these are experts that, that yeah. are county employees, but they're people that we use because they're area of expertise, and that's why I look at Mark. You know, he has an area of expertise that's hard to match. Hard to match by well, you don't you don't find you just don't find people. A lot of people every day, you know, that have that enthusiasm, but, and it'll do the research, like I've seen him. Yeah, and as a, as I have to admit, I, this is the first day I've seen this document, and it, it's one of the better documents I've seen. Um, you know, it's funny because I had a couple of the founders of already in my office just a few days ago, encouraging something very similar to what you just uh, proposed. So. And they've been, they were, they basically created so ready. And so I was, I was their they council. were part of, they didn't, was the They were part of the, the founders. So let's yeah. not, oh, sorry. Okay. I didn't say that. Remember, I have a whole history here. You, I'm not going to comment on that. That was too easy. <laughs>
But uh, so yeah, I can I can see the, the benefit of it. Can I call for the vote? Yeah. Well, the chair can. Yeah. yeah. Well, he can call. Anybody for the can call for the question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Question's been called. Um, roll call. Commissioner Rasher. Yes. Commissioner Bidenthal. Yes. Commissioner Hunter. No. Motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Do we have anything uh, moving down the agenda? Do we have anything from 12 so I've got about a 20 minute presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Kelly's not here, so I know that's not here. <laughs> nothing new on 1207. Okay. Do we have anything for executive session? I don't. Nope. Okay, having none, then we will uh, close this uh, general session here at 12.02 p.m. 12.10. Pardon me? 12.10. 12 oh, 12.10 wants to embarrass. So, 12.10. Right. Okay, microphone, that's 12.10 p.m. <laughs> this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>